Yes. Yeah. yeah, there are already around 30, almost 30 people are there in YouTube. But the oh, okay. is not going up. Come on, YouTube. Okay, now it is on YouTube. My, my chat window is gone. Yes, yep, that's because one of the Aussies. We can now see it in YouTube. That's awesome. Okay, we are live. Okay. Why can't I chat? My, my chat window is gone. Yeah, mine too. You can click <clears throat> the chat button below and it will come up. Hello, everybody. Uh, welcome to another rocking episode of Extra Bytes. And today we have um, it's, a, it's a special session for all of us. I think it's like a dream come true for uh, all of us here and everybody who's watching across the globe uh, on YouTube. And you know what is so special about it? Um, uh, we have we have two specials today. One is that we have three three top-notch photographers and wonderful friends joining us. Why three of them? Uh, I'll get back to that uh, in a in a moment. Um, and we also have uh, uh, before I start introducing the speakers, uh, let me first give the introduction. Uh, about um, the panelists. So we have Himadri Bhuan, uh, we have Prakash Kumar Singh, uh, we have Som Roy, and we have Atanu, and we have Sandeep Mathur. And uh, we've been together. So I'm just Sue Broy from Exploring Light. We have been into photography education from almost uh, 10, 11 years now. And uh, this lockdown, we, we thought of uh, starting something totally different and, and uh, fresh. We're, uh, we are trying to bring wonderful and uh, photographer, landscape photographers and some other genres as well um, to all of you and trying to share their stories from their own mouth. And uh, if they can inspire you, if that, that can make a lockdown a little more comfortable, uh, I think uh, we all will be happy. Um, so let me just uh, give you some brief uh, uh, background into this. I think this is probably the biggest stage yet for all of us. Um, we have three leaders of, uh, of a genre that we all love, that is landscape. Uh, for people who might not be aware, TJ, um, uh, Thorn, and um, Alex and Ted are not just contemporaries, but best friends as well. They are a rare reminder and reinforcer that it's not always lonely at the top. You can always be with best of the friends. Um, and for a field as competitive as landscape photography, they indi individually have had a different approach to their creative vision and yet managed to stick together uh, with each other. They are truly the role models of their generation. And I think I, think I was talking to a few people um, yesterday and I said that if we have um, uh, in landscape photography someone to look up to, we have these three gentlemen. And uh, we are so proud and privileged to have all of you here. Welcome to Exploring Light, this, this um, platform. And um, so I, I hope this today's session is going to be rocking. And um, so I think let me, let me start the uh, kind of uh, session. And, and uh, let me first come to give you a brief introduction about three of them. So TJ was in uh, uh, culinary industry. Um, am, am I right? Yes, if that's correct. Just, please, please correct me as well. So Alex was in IT and Ted yep. is a chemical engineer. And uh, so my question to all of you, three of you is that um, where did it all go wrong and how did you end up in photography? <laughs> So, so what happened that you came together in photography? Some talk to us about your journeys and the most memorable moments in your photography career. And uh, so, you have the freedom to interact, interject. Okay. Yeah. 
you can't thrash each other. Uh, e thrashing. Well, let's is uh, <laughs> <laughs> let's uh, probably start with how we got into photography, right? I mean, because we all came from different backgrounds. Ted, did I hear chemical engineer? Yeah, well, I'm not a practicing. I wasn't. I was never a practicing chemical engineer. I, I studied it. That's where I got. How my do degree. I know? How do I not know this about you? I thought you were always a graphic <laughs> designer. That's how we got us out of Death Valley when we broke down. What's that? That's what how you got us out of Death Valley when we broke down. Fix the truck with your chemical yeah, engineer. Yeah. Right. I mean, I guess I'll, I can go first. Uh, for me, yeah, yeah. you know, I. Yeah, I was in the culinary industry. Um, I grew up with a forest in my backyard and just always outside. So I, nature has always been like a really integral part of my life, especially during my formative years. You know, I didn't spend time inside watching TV. I was outside riding dirt bikes, climbing trees, playing in the yard and stuff like that. Um, so when I moved to Oregon, you know, there's obviously, it's beautiful here and there's a lot of outdoor opportunity so I just kind of started going on hikes and, you know, I've always, I've always done photography, just not nature photography. Um, and I kind of came at it from the hiking side of things. I remember I was looking uh, recently at this hiking forum message board that I used to be a part of, and I was posting my images on there when, when 500 PX was existing and kind of getting rolling. I was posting images on a hiking forum because I had no clue that there was even a landscape photography uh, genre or community. So I was always out hiking and taking photos. And the more that I went hiking, the more it be started becoming about the photos and the photography itself. And then I eventually uh, ended up discovering 500px um, back in the in its heyday and kind of realized that there was a, a landscape pho photography genre out there. So I just kind of uh, jumped with both feet in and started learning as much as I could and, you know, meeting people and things like that. And I ended up meeting Ted and Alex way back then. I think I met Alex when that was like, what, 2012, 12, 13, around that. We, uh, I think it was 12. Yeah. Yeah. I went on a, uh, my first photography trip that I had ever been on with two guys that I didn't know. And we ended up driving all the way from the Oregon coast to the Eastern Oregon uh, wildflower area like overnight and ended up meeting Alex there um, early in the morning and um, he drove me home was it after me, that that you <laughs> I drove you home yeah you, you drove me home and made me and, and made me pay for gas I did oh, I'm sorry I would never do that now yeah, oh that's cheap yeah, we're, 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 you're both poor uh, you, yeah. were, you were more poor than me but no uh yeah that's and then Ted I think uh I think I just discovered Ted on 500px. I kind of bumped shoulders, and that's when he was first starting getting started. And started so messaging him. There's what? something about a tree. I was trying to figure yeah, out you, what a tree was. I was and, Hawaii shots, and you were trying to figure out what a plant was. And I just love like kind of <laughs> figuring things out and going on Google searches. So I ended up messaging Ted um, about what that plant was, and the rest was history. Did you? message me about a backpack or something yeah. i think you remember telling you. me yeah because like when i first discovered you know like i said i came from the hiking background so i uh always had um you know i didn't know that there were like photography backpacks out there so i was i messaged i emailed you we didn't have <laughs> what's the best backpack to buy what, what, Which what backpack you use? yeah and you're just like you know i thought you were like some big kind of big big time photographer based on your profile photo because you had like all that, that soft light that what that profile photo where you look like you were 40 years old your beard is really thick yeah so i messaged. thought i was big that. time yeah and you're like you're like i just threw it into like a jans port or something yeah i just had my high school backpack i threw all my camera gear in there and it would just clang around that's not that's not how most people do it no. so that's where it all started and then yeah we just i think on 500 px we just all kind of um started oh. uh building a relationship okay so so uh, it, uh, three of you started to almost together or somebody was already doing it so uh i think i started landscape photography before tj but he's been shooting for like 50 years i mean he's a lot older than he looks <laughs> uh, <laughs> um, don't dye my hair i don't dye my hair though so I'm not at that point yet I, yeah i started uh, just over a decade ago, I I bought a camera for eBay to sell things on eBay, and I uh, 
just started playing with the manual settings and got obsessed with it. And then uh, I grew up in a very boring place of the U.S., uh, a boring area as far as the landscapes go. And then I took a road trip out west, which is where all the famous landscapes are, all the mountains and deserts. And that uh, kind of, I moved out west shortly after that and started focusing on nature exclusively. So that that changed my life. But I was doing IT before and uh, then just happened to buy a camera for eBay. That's That changed everything. But I, I, I'm just over a decade. I think TJ has been doing it for a long time. But seriously, I don't know how long since 2012 so eight okay. years yeah okay and Ted, about you yeah um well like you said uh chemical engineering i was at i was at school at georgia tech studying chemical engineering and um that's when i, I kind of i got really into backpacking there um with some of my roommates and um just really fell in love with um, nature and backpacking and was doing a ton of backpacking um and after, well, towards the end of my college career, um, I joined up with one of my roommates and we actually did a, a short film contest. And the, the contest was based around using iMovie. It was, it was when iMovie like first came out. And I actually had a Mac then and like nobody else had Macs. So um, <clears throat> the, um, he recu recruited me to help because I had iMovie. And that just kind of launched this whole thing into like digital imagery, um, which, you know, launched me. I mean, basically right after college, I went straight into doing like digital arts and motion graphics and stuff. And, um, but during college, my dad actually bought me, my dad's always been into photography and um, he bought me a little um, digital camera. Like when they were first coming out, it was a Nikon Coolpix. I mean, it was like this big and um, I think it had two megapixels, but um, so I, I started like shooting around with that and, and kind of, uh, you know, got really drawn to photography and, you know, would like go take pictures of a flower and stuff. And, um, and I remember uh, I showed my, I was showing my dad a picture I had taken and he said something to me that kind of always stuck. And it was, um, he was like, yeah, I mean, he, he said, um, yeah, that's great. You know, it's, it's easy to take pictures of beautiful things. Now try taking beautiful pictures of ugly things. And that kind of always stuck with me as like, a, you know, poignant um, bit of advice. Although, you know, shooting landscape photography, you're rarely shooting something that's ugly, really. But um, so, yeah, I was kind of always dabbling in photography and then in like 2012, um, I went on a cruise to Alaska with my family. And at that point I was like, um, you know, while I'm there, I want to, I want to take really good pictures of, of all the, you know, the nature. So I started looking into doing that and found this whole thing about landscape photography and, you know, bought a new camera, got all the lenses, got the filters and all that stuff. And, um, and, uh, after that, I was kind of, you know, the rest is history. I just, I, you know, fell crazy in love with it and, um, just became kind of obsessed. So that's, that's pretty much it. So I was doing it first is what, what we've okay. learned <laughs> like by a year or two. <laughs> the guys who, who still don't know, um, uh, that about Ted, that Ted was on a almost long hiatus of uh, two years almost, where he was uh, not in public, uh, 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 public light, and uh, he's coming out of that today. And it's it's uh, I think a wonderful feeling. We've been getting a lot of messages um, that so, so Ted is going to be there. So there's a lot of excitement around uh, Ted you being here. And uh, they being able to see you today and to be able to yeah. hear you almost after a um, gap of almost two years. Am I right? What's that? How long is your hiatus? Hiatus. Oh, um, yeah. I years? mean, it's, it's, it's been a couple of years, yeah, since I put anything out. Um, but yeah, I, I mean, um, my wife and I bought a house like three and a half years ago. And um, it really just kind of threw me for a loop. Um, it was a, 
yeah, it just, it just kind of took me by surprise and, and um, really kind of shut me down. And at that point I, I was also getting um, pretty burned out. I was trying to do a lot of workshops um, and uh, it just, it was kind of wearing me down and then, you know, add that into the mix. And I don't know, I just kind of shut down and I had to pull away for a while, but. <clears throat> but here you are. A couple, he, yeah. <laughs> he, he's been working on, he's been working on some images. He'll, he'll release them when he's ready. And I've been giving him a lot of uh, grief about it. He gets upset with me. Yeah. But, but he's, uh, you know, I think it's important that we all just like kind of remember why we do it and try to do it for the right reasons and, you know, not, not uh, wait for like, you know, not give into the, all the expectations that, you know, we might feel. So I think that's kind of what Ted's dealing with now, if I'm right. I don't know. Yeah. I mean, you know, there, there's kind of a, um, there can be a lot of pressure with it. You know, it's like, um, it's, uh, it's hard to deal with, I guess, pleasing your audience. <laughs> Um, and, and not getting caught up in, you know, whatever you put out, um, meeting some bar that you've set for yourself or, you know, is, is this going to be acceptable to everyone? Is everyone going to love this? Am I going to get tons of likes and, you know, whatever. So it, it's, it's been hard for me to like separate from that and like shoot for myself. So, um, I'm trying to get more back to that. <clears throat> And you set a really high bar. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So it's, it's been a little tough. <laughs> we can attest to that. Anybody has any questions, guys? Uh, Som, Prakash, Sandeep, anybody? Well, we have lots of questions for sure. Let's take one by one. Ah, Let's so start with we, are here, we are here to hear you guys. So just. Oh, OK. <laughs> you know. How do you plan and shoot and process and stuff like that? So how do you do the whole thing? <laughs> so, so let, let, me, let, let me take this forward. So I think everybody is waiting for uh, to hear from them. So um, I think TJ moved in from Pennsylvania and Alex from Wisconsin and Ted from, from uh, Georgia. How did you guys move into the West Coast and how do you make an effort to stay yourself in an already crowded Pennsylvania seat? So, any, any thoughts on that? How do we make an effort to, what was the last part? How, how do, do we stay yourself in an already crowded uh, scene? So, so. Yeah, I still didn't get well, that. Well, I, how did we uh, make how do we establish ourselves, I guess, yeah. right? Is, oh, how do okay. we establish yeah. ourselves yeah. in a, a crowded yeah. field? I mean, I, I, I was in Pennsylvania and I just, I don't, I don't get along with the East Coast. I'm not like an East Coast soul. Um, so, you know, I, back when I moved to Oregon, I was really into snowboarding. Like snowboarding was my life. I started snowboarding in 19, wait, wait, 1990 is when I got my first snowboard and I was really into it. That was like, that was all I lived for. Like kind of how like I am with photography now. Um, that's how I was with snowboarding. Every, every winter I would voluntarily get laid off from my job just so I could snowboard as much as possible. And I competed in half pipe across like the East coast of the United States. Um, but you know, the, you always dream about going out West and, you know, Mount hood in Oregon was like, uh, it was like Mecca for, for that kind of stuff because you could snowboard in the summer and that's where all the, the snowboard camps were in the summer because there, there are glaciers and you can you know so it was just like you can snowboard all year round in oregon and i can go snowboarding in the morning and then be on the coast and watch sunset at night so you know oregon was always just like this place that i wanted to go and when i it got to the point in pennsylvania where i just couldn't stay any longer and i just felt like i needed something new and exciting in my life um, I'd never been to Oregon. I didn't have a job. I didn't have a place to live. I just made plans to leave and I actually secured a place to live while I was driving across the country in my 1995 Honda Civic with, you know, a U-Haul attached to the back and I couldn't get it over 55 miles an hour. Um, but it was like, it was the most cathartic thing I'd ever done. Just like 
kind of leaving this place that I felt like was holding me back and like, you know, I had the open world, the open road and, you know, go west young man, they say, and, you know, just like the future ahead of me. And I remember when I crossed into the Oregon border, I just like, I broke down. I was, it was so emotional. And, you know, that is, was when I fell in love with Oregon. I, you know, I often talk about that drive. It was probably one of the most pivotal points in my life. And yeah, you know, and then getting here, like, you know, like I said, like I just started going hiking and really getting into that thing. So when I discovered that there was a landscape photography genre, I just, I just started posting pictures and learning more about it. You know, I wasn't trying to establish myself or become a big name. I was just having fun. And, you know, I, yeah, like the, the, the scene wasn't as crowded back then. You know, the Pacific Northwest was a hot spot, but we didn't have Instagram the way that we have Instagram. There wasn't like this whole, you know, I think it was at the very beginning of the landscape photography boom that I got in, but there that wasn't. Time it was Flickr there. Uh, Flickr was more popular as a as a platform, right? Yeah. Yeah, I think back then. Yeah. yeah back then, Flickr was. Yeah. Yeah. That... So yeah, there was, I was say, yeah, there was already a, st a scene established, um, but it wasn't anything like it is now. Easier to get in. I should mention for anyone in India that doesn't know the east and west coast of the US, the east coast where TJ came from is like very busy, crowded, bustling, and the west coast is really open and chill and a lot more interesting landscapes. It's just it's, it's chill, like, man. Yeah, chill. It's like that that's exactly the way to put it. You know, east coast it's all it's busy. Um it has a more like I guess I would say uptight kind of attitude about it. You know, you, you have New York, you have Boston, and just like there's like this. It's because it's know, money. West Coast is just a lot more like relaxing and like shock bra. Yeah. They're kind of like, you know, yeah, that applies to Washington. That applies to I moved from East Coast to West Coast as well. I mean, kind of the same reason as TJ. I yeah. can relate to whatever TJ is saying, very core to the bone. And, you know, exact reason is that. Yeah. And so, uh, I came from the Midwest, which is um, just very flat. It's a lot of farmland and uh, really cold, long winters. So there's there's not a lot of outdoor activity there. Like it's just it's boring, in my opinion. The uh, there are some nice places, like the the Great Lakes are cool, but um, I really hadn't grown up with any inspiring landscapes. I had only seen it in video games and film and imagined it um, when reading and then I took this uh, road trip out west with my friends like a year after I started photography and we went through all the deserts of Utah and got out to California and saw the mountains and the sequoia forests and Death Valley I mean I just saw all sorts of stuff that I could never have dreamed of growing up in the flat farmlands in the Midwest. And I moved out there like two months after we did that road trip. I just picked up my life and left because I was already self-employed in IT. I had the freedom to do whatever I wanted to do. So I moved out West and then I, I initially moved to California and found out that's not for me, it's too crowded. And then I moved up to Oregon. I wanted to be around the rain and the forests and, uh, still be on the west coast and then i really started getting into the landscape photography community i just started talking to everyone on Flickr, like you said that was a big platform at the time i yeah. uh, just started messaging people i looked up to and uh trying to get in with people and just make friends in the community and eventually i did i don't know how but somehow i got in and uh, <laughs> i think it was easier than like tj said there's so many so much competition now and so many people with so many similar images. I can't really, it's harder to stand out. I think now back then it was easier to do something novel to help build a name. Although like TJ said, that's not what I was trying to do. I mean, I just wanted to shoot and just wanted to make some friends doing the same thing. This is interesting. You also feel that uh, things are getting, uh, even more crowded in terms of landscape photography scene uh, and, and uh, difficult to stand out? Well, 
difficult to do just decent work and stand out. I think that yeah. there's a lot of learning material out there and a lot of styles that people kind of imitate and you just end up with so many very similar but indistinguishable photographs. And I just, I think it's actually maybe easier to stand out if you're doing something original, but it's more difficult to make a name of yourself or, or make uh, found find your own audience if you're basically doing the same thing as everyone else. And I think that there's a lot of that going on right now, but that's kind of getting off topic, I guess. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and so Ted, what about you? Um, I basically came out West for work. Um, I was, uh, I do motion graphic design and um, I started doing it in Atlanta, but the hot spots for that are New York and LA. And at first I went to New York and actually lived there for a year, <clears throat> but um, was then offered a job yeah. out in LA. So <clears throat> I moved out here and that was uh, 2006. Um, so I've been here for 14 years now, but um, my, my love for the West um, really started in college. I, I actually did um, uh, two summer internships at Intel in the Bay area. And I was out there um, working for them and, and, pretty much every other weekend I would go out to Yosemite and go backpacking, um, which just, I mean, I fell in love with that place. And I think at one point I, I calculated up the, um, all the miles I had hiked in that park. And it's something like 800 miles of the trail in that park. Um, but yeah, that, that really, um, was the foundation for my love of like the mountains in the West. Um, so, yeah. I well, still haven't been to Yosemite. I haven't oh. been in a long time. It's just so crowded now. It's really, yeah, it's that's... really kind of a bummer. Yeah, still going in the summer. Yeah, yeah. So, so coming back to TJ, um, your work and words inspire us. Uh, I think most of us at various levels. And, and you once said that never forget why you, why you shoot. Um, could you please emphasize more on that and um, uh, probably include your philosophy on um, handling light and how do you do that? Why do you think so? And maybe whatever your thoughts are on that. Yeah, sure. Uh, you know, you know. So my personal um, experience was that uh, you know it's it's easy to get caught up in trying to do the the popular thing um you know especially when you're starting out you you know we all we all we all stand on the shoulders of the people before us so when you are start learning you see the people who are that you that inspire you and and things like that and you you don't know what your voice is so you start trying to emulate them and finding their comps and things like that and i remember you know back when I first got into it, that I was really kind of going that route um, and just maybe not shooting um, from my heart, I guess. But okay. I'm trying to, I'm trying to place it. Um, you know, like, like, like I said, like, you know, when I first started going out to to nature it was to hike and it was to see the nature it wasn't to take photos the photos just kind of happened like so I was going out to nature and photos were happening and then it started the more I started getting into it it was like I was going out to do photography and nature would happen so like it kind of it kind of flip-flopped so instead of going out to nature and that being my inspiration I was going to a waterfall that I saw online to take a photo of that waterfall. And I wasn't just, it was coming from the wrong place. I was going out with a results um, oriented mindset that I wanted to go out and get a photo, not I wanted to go out and interact with the landscape and maybe a photo would happen. Um, and, you know, I, I became really unhappy and disconnected with my work. I, there were still times where, you know, I, I had photos and I was able to connect to them and find metaphors for what I was going through in life or things like that. But 
you know, it, it really flip flopped for me. So when I discovered that, you know, I kind of really started thinking back onto like, what really, what do I really love about nature? And it was just interacting with nature. So I kind of started trying to break that habit. Um, and now when I go out to shoot, I don't go out with an idea of what I'm going to photograph. I just go out and if something calls to me, um, then I give into it. And, you know, I talk a lot about how I view photography not as taking a picture. It's more of a way that I can explore the environment that I'm in in a more intimate way. So, you know, I, I do a lot of thinking <laughs> Um, probably more than I should. And I, uh, I write a lot of my thoughts down and they're all, it's a big giant mess of notes on different platforms in my notebook on my phone or like in a, in a document on Google documents. And, you know, so I have like all these bits and pieces of things that I've thought in the past. And I've recently started going back to them and I'm realizing like now, even that, you know, I'm finding thoughts that I thought four or five years ago that have just been solidified subconsciously in my mind. Um, and one of those is, you know, like, you know, I was, when I'm involved with a subject, when I'm, when I'm doing photography, like, it's just like, it's like the world melts away. You know, like, I, like, I'm just so honed in, in my viewfinder, that the only thing that exists at that time is me and that subject. And I know it kind of like, sounds weird or whatever, but, you know, I won't notice that an hour has passed and I've been shooting the same little wave on a river for that hour. And it's just cause it's just like, I'm so into it and I'm trying to learn its intricacies and the way it behaves and just really like just existing at that moment in time. So, you know, that's kind of how I approach nature now. And that's you know, interesting. Yeah. Somebody, uh, somebody recently in a podcast, somebody recently asked me like, you know, whether I shoot for subject or light first and it, without hesitation I was like light and they asked me why and I'm like I, I don't know but in going back in those notes that I had written down I had written something about that that I was just like you know it it's always been this subconscious thing and I'm always exploring those things um, and I guess I did kind of find an answer back then that I was able to kind of connect the dots once I read it recently and it was just like you know like every decision that I've made in life or like, you know, as a whole, every, everything that I've done has led me to that moment in time where I'm interacting with that thing, whether it's a small decision or a big decision, like moving to Oregon, or, you know, that's a big decision or a small decision. Like let's go to this specific spot today. That's a smaller decision, but all of those decisions, you know, add up to me being in that particular time in that particular place and experiencing that particular moment. So when light happens and it's like a, you know, a fleeting moment of light, I feel like that light is there for me and I want to develop that relationship with it. So I focus on that light. So, you know, I do love shooting light in all forms, whether it's, you know, I, I, I see direct light on, on things and most people would be like, ah, it's bright, you know, and kind of point away from it and go shoot something that has a little bit softer light or better light. And I'm just like, you know, I, I point at it. I, I point at the brightest light that is interacting with anything and I either slow it down or darken it and see what is int what's, what's interesting that's, or see what is happening and whether or not it's interesting. And, you know, to me, like I said, to me, it's not about getting a shot. It's just about interacting with the landscape. So I think, you know, kind of like what we said about don't forget why we shoot, you know, I shoot because it helps me interact with the landscape and it brings me to a place in my heart that um, calms me and makes me feel like everything's going to be okay, you know? So I know that was a really long answer. But yeah, I forgot what the question was, TJ. I, I rambled. But no, it's just like, you know, like I just had that realization, like, you know, why do I shoot light? Like, I couldn't connect the dots until I went back and read a note that I wrote three years ago about why I interact with light and then you know so I'm always I'm always exploring those things and, and kind of connecting dots along the way um and it's just being very introspective yeah, that's very interesting how about taking us through some of your favorite images DJ, DJ so so yeah so we right understand now? what you said so I think it's going to be 
wonderful going through your images right um <clears throat> let's see what are my favorite images right now so my favorite images right now so uh I know I'll have to share my screen. I'm just getting it up first. You can. Let's see him, TJ. Patience. All right. So. I don't know why you think a landscape photographer would have patience. <laughs> so this is this is currently. Can you guys see my screen? Yes, yeah. Yes. Okay, so this is currently one of my favorite images, and this is exactly what I was talking about, about pointing at um, the brightest things. If I move, wait, okay. Can you see like my little zoom toolbar with you guys on it here on my screen? Or is that just for me? Yeah, we can see the mouse. You just see Photoshop, that's all? Yeah, yeah. we can see your mouse uh, pointer is visible. Your image and pointer, mouse pointer. Yeah, okay. Zoom doesn't show up in the screen share. Okay, I didn't know. Okay, cool, because now I can put you guys over the image. So, um, yeah, like this was, you know, I I took this on a workshop um, that I was leading on the Oregon coast. And, you know, it's at this, this beach that I don't necessarily have a connection to. It doesn't call to me. It doesn't like, you know, when I, when I get there, the beach as a whole, um, as a large scene, it's very, it's beautiful, but as a large scene, it doesn't um, fit the way that I want. You know, there's no, like, I'm not, in, I'm not photographically inspired by the landscape. I like being there and I connect with it. Um, you know, so this, this morning there was a sunrise and, you know, it was nice and the, the clients were shooting the sunrise and, but since the, it didn't really call to me, I just kind of, you know, helped them out and whatever, but not until, and this is what I talk about, you know, subject versus light, but not until the sun rose well after sunrise and started shining right where like the, the surf was coming up and then receding and just kind of wetting the sand, the light was hitting that. So this is like late morning, you know, most people, I guess, may, 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 may have left by then because the, the light was gone, the light was starting to get harsh, but, you know, I, I saw something that the light was doing. So I pointed my camera at it and I just, I spent some time with this harsh light, just interacting with the surf coming in and out. And it was just very pleasing to me. So, um, you know, just, just an example of how I prioritize light over subject and just react to what is being given to me right then and there. So, you know, I think a lot of the clients were really surprised that when I called them, I was like, hey, look at this, what's going on. You know, they're like, wow, I never would have thought that. Because when you look at it, you're just like, you kind of want to shield your eyes. And I'm just like, okay. So I put my light, my my camera at it, and and just uh, play around with it and explore it and build a relationship with like this water and this light kind of interacting. So this is kind of one of my favorite shots right now of the coast. The coast was always, you know, I've, I've been to the coast a lot and I've spent a lot of time shooting it, but I never really had a lot of images. Um, and I don't I don't know why. Maybe it was just because I didn't find a like some like solace or like in my heart when I went there. Um, but the more time I've been spending there, the more I've been um, getting closer to it. So now finally I'm starting to really enjoy a lot of the shots that I take out on the coast. And this is my favorite one. So it's not a big giant grand epic scene, but this is a representation of something in nature that really called to me that I spent some time with and that was you know a soulful experience to me and that's kind of where I like to come from with photography okay great. does anybody have any questions or about this image or anything it's pretty straightforward I mean there's not even like I didn't even do a lot of processing to that you know I basically like I wanted this uh I have I have one question is this a black sand beach in Oregon is it I what? would try two hours is it a today black sand? <laughs> it's not I'm sorry. Uh, no, it's just sand, but it's it's oh. it's rendered it's rendered darker because it's not getting hit with the light. You know, like I exposed obviously for the light here. And yeah, relative not, to the light. There. Yeah, there's not a lot of blowout here, so you know when you're shooting um, direct light, there's a lot of contrast because okay. it's creating you know harsh shadows and things like that. 
So right. and if you look close, you can actually, there is some soft light kind of hitting around on the sand, but it's, it, it, it's rendered darker just because I'm exposing for the light and there's not that direct right. light hitting here. It's not reflecting anything. So the light here was actually, it was a really foggy morning. So there was a little bit of diffusion happening, but this area was just very bright. So yeah, it's not, it's not black sand. Um, it's just dark in general. I was thinking that Oregon has a black sand, and then I was like, okay, I need to go there, there right now. <laughs> no, <laughs> not black sand, but but every bit is beautiful, you know. It's yeah, like it's like Ted was saying, make uh, make beautiful uh, photos out of things that might not be ugly, you know, or that might be ugly. Very beautiful. What else? Did you want to see another one? Yeah. Do you, uh, do you have all those shots from uh, the riverbed or the water, the shine of the sun? Shining through. Hmm. Which one? I don't know. Just pick one. You know, like uh, the the one where you've got the small stars on uh, sparkling. Was it some water? Yeah, 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 yeah. Here, let's uh, so let's pull up one of these. I have to figure out where it is. Um, it is in. That's not special, man. Dropbox, here, and little suns. All right, so this one. Uh, we can't see your screen yet. It's coming. Okay. This one? Yes. So yeah, so, and this is, you know, another example of um, photographing for the light and not for the scene, you know, like, so this was taken at a really, one of my favorite waterfalls, actually, a very beautiful waterfall. And I think, Sam, you were there. You've been to this waterfall, Abiqua Falls. Yes. Oh. So, you know, it's a, it's a very picturesque waterfall. Um, and we were there in the middle of the day, and the whole amphitheater was just kind of washed out in harsh light. But so what this is, is like these little squiggles and everything. This is a really shallow part of the splash pool um, of the waterfall, where the water is just kind of like, you know, the waterfall is plunging down. It's creating these waves. And then as they reach the shore, they're just ripples. And as the water was rippling in the bright light, it was the light was being refracted through the water and kind of creating these little these little uh, patterns. And you'll see things like this, um, you know, if you look in when the sun's really high, and you look in shallow water, you'll see kind of like these little uh, light snakes, I call them. Um, yeah. And there was also direct light hitting the water, so it was kind of like flashing all these little things. So I just took a really fast shutter speed and pointed at an interesting area where the water was kind of had had a really nice flow to it and just uh, try to anticipate that harmonious moment. And this is um, becoming one of my favorite water shots, actually. So what was the f-stop on this, DJ? What was the f-stop? Uh, let's see. Nope, not that. Um, so it was taken uh, at, let's see. F twenty nine. Wow. So, so you know, I, so I wanted. Um, I was shooting it a little bit. It's at three hundred millimeters, and you know, not too far away from me. So there's a lot of, you know, there there was a lot of uh, focal plane that I wanted to get in focus, um, and also I wanted to have a smaller aperture aperture so that I would get the sun stars. Right. So you know, shooting at f twenty nine. And, you know, even though there is direct light hitting it with all those sun stars, it wasn't a lot of direct light. So, you know, being stopped down to, to F29 and wanting a really fast shutter speed at 1 320th of a second to freeze that action, um, I had to have ISO 2000. So, you know, and, and I'm fine it's with clean. shooting. Yeah, I'm fine with shooting really high ISOs on water because it's water and it takes it can handle a lot of noise reduction to kind of get rid of all that grain and stuff. But um, what about at F29 TJ? Aren't you worried about sharpness on the water? <laughs> water the water's very sharp, very sharp. No. Shouldn't, uh, shouldn't you focus stack it at F8? Yeah, and, you know, and a lot of people, you know, and and I I I when I talk about these images, is Ted not on the feed anymore? I'm here. I'm here. It just oh, doesn't show everyone. Oh, oh, hi, Ted. I missed you. Like six, hey. um, 
you know, a lot of like when I talk about this stuff and show these images, like I did a presentation at a conference recently and people were, you know, I'm like talking about like all this really soulful stuff and like how I connect and interact with nature and, you know, how it inspires me and, you know, all this like really like emotional stuff and like all of the questions I got were technical. And it was kind of, it wasn't, it wasn't sad, but I think people focus too much on like the technical aspects of things. Like, you know, I'm just, I'm making decisions in the field about what I'm doing. Um, you know, some of them are guesses and I just kind of, you know, I start with a base, a base guess based on experience of what I want to accomplish and kind of, you know, obviously I was shooting at 300 millimeters almost at my feet. So I needed a, you know, I needed some deep depth of field. So I was like, okay, well, I'll go to F29, I guess. And then, you know, get the shutter speed that I want and then base my ISO off of that. But, you know, people are like, well, what about diffraction? And what about sharpness? And what about this? And what about that? I'm just like, you know, I, I, I do care about quality, but like at the at the end of the day, who cares? You know, like, you know, only photographers are going to look at this image and be like, oh, I wonder what settings they used. You know, like my primary goal is interacting with nature in a way that's meaningful to me. And if I get a shot, cool. You know, if not, I'm st I still had that moment and I still built that relationship and that wasn't wasted time. But if I do get a shot that I like, I don't care necessarily if it's I have a lot to say about that actually, but I won't get into that because that could be a huge tangent. Um, no one's going to remember your photo for being sharp. Exactly. Yeah. Like, you know, I, I do care it's about what makes things. it impactful. Right. You know, it's, it's the emotional response that, um, that you get that's important. It's not whether or not it was sharp in the corners or things like that. And like I said, I do care about that. And, almost to a fault. And I was uh, recently talking to my girlfriend about this, about like this uh, kind of like this perfectionist attitude that I have about my photos. And I kind of connected the dots on that. It's that like, you know, back when I talk about how when I'm interacting with nature and it's just me in that moment, um, in my mind, that moment is perfect. Like there is nothing else in the world that is there's, there's nothing else in my mind other than me in that, that moment. And that's when I'm in my flow state, when I'm connected, it's just me and that subject. And that moment is perfect to me. So if, if I get a photo of that moment, I also want that moment to reflect how perfect that I thought it was. So when I look at shots and there's something about it that bugs me or, um, you know, whether it's something out of focus or diffraction or something about the composition or, you know, any of the aspect of the photo, if there's something about it that bugs me, um, it doesn't make the cut. And if it does make the cut, you know, most often when I'm going through my portfolio, which I do a lot, I'm always going through my images that I have on my website and just studying them and seeing if there's anything that bothers me. And if there is something that bothers me, it doesn't accurately reflect how important and perfect that moment was to me. So it either wears on me to the point where I eventually delete it or um, somehow I find uh, a way to get over that um, because the photo itself um, is too important to me um, or just doesn't make the cut. But, you know, I, I care a lot about my photos not having anything in them that are distracting to me because I wasn't distracted in that moment. I was in tune. So if there's something in my photo that distracts me or, or makes me feel... Uh, that it's less than perfect than that moment, then, you know, I usually don't make, it doesn't make the cut, if that makes sense. I don't know. That's a wonderful uh, uh, explanation because, because what you said is um, something which uh, must be, must be understood by the new age photographers that uh, uh, how you interact with the nature and you don't let technicalities get into your way of, of uh, interacting with the nature while you are out in the field. I think, I think that is important. And one more thing that, that just came to my mind is that uh, most of um, us novices would probably, when they when we look at this, we'll, we'll immediately uh, start hunting for our uh, circular polarizer, trying to <laughs> remove these reflections. Right. Yeah. I don't... Yeah, uh, when, when, they make it more interesting. 
Yeah, I mean, I, I, I shoot reflections on water a lot. And, you know, so there's, and I've even had, you know, I have a shot um, that has been on my mind for years that I've never really worked. Um, it's of this place in Oregon called Anianta Gorge. And it's this beautiful canyon. It's really narrow and it has a creek running down the middle. And the creek goes from like wall to wall. So you're just like basically in this canyon, almost like, you know, like kind of like a Zion Narrows. And it's a very popular place, was a very popular place. Um, so you have these beautiful green mossy walls and the forest above it and it's all very green and then this creek coming down and you know most people would shoot it with the polarizer to get rid of the glare but i was like what if i shot it with the polarizer off and you know still did a long exposure and you know from the vantage that i had it almost looked like it's like like mercury or melted metal it's like this silver that's kind of flowing through the scene so you know, when I'm interacting with the landscape and taking shots and things like that, you know, I'm, I'm always experimenting because camera memory is cheap. And I tell people, you know, I tell people in my workshop, I'm like, take crappy photos, you know, explore, experiment, because, you know, there are a lot of things that I, a lot of creative doors that I wouldn't have opened if I wasn't just like, what would happen if I did this, you know, shooting, shooting a creek with a polarizer off, nobody does that. I'm like, Okay, well, what would happen if I did? And it's a shot that I really like. So, you know, yeah, I just I think, there, there are rules and and things like that. I, I don't I don't like the you should do this. You know. I was just gonna say I think that that reflects a kind of a mentality that there's a certain way to do everything and uh and also a focus on gear, like, oh, what filter should I get out? Like, why do you even need a filter? Do you have a reason to need it? Or do you just, has someone told you that you should always use a filter in this situation? Like, don't worry yeah. about the gear, worry about what you're seeing. I think what you're saying, Alex, is uh, uh, very, very right, because um, most of the uh, people who attend these kinds of workshops, they start taking um, the teachings that are done by mentors like you and um, TJ to verbatim that they, they would remember that you might have told that to cut down the reflection, you must use CPL. And the moment they see the reflection, the first thing they think about is that statement that you probably made that now take out the CPL and remove this. And you stop forgetting, uh, you, you stop visualizing and, and you start getting into that gear mania that uh, what do I have to manage this? gear and uh like prescribed approach which is yeah. not how you end up with images like this yeah. you can't yeah. Yeah. can't make images like this if you're just following a formula you just have to yeah. listen to yourself and see and, and like i said like this was at a, a really picturesque waterfall and there were other photographers there and they were taking pictures of the waterfall and here i am you know out in the canyon where it's really bright pointing at like this little you know where it's just lapping up and they're looking at me like I'm nuts. And one of them actually came up to me like, what are you, what are you taking the picture of? And I showed them, they're like, oh, okay. So, you know, it's like I said, like, you know, I, I was at this waterfall, but it wasn't the waterfall that was calling to me. It was beautiful. I looked at it. I've taken pictures of it. I have one, I've been to this waterfall dozens of times, dozens and dozens of times. Um, I have one shot of it in my portfolio, but I have at least four or five shots from that location, not of the waterfall in my portfolio. So, you know, when I go to those places, it's not about like, what should I shoot? You know, like, oh, I'm at this waterfall. I should be shooting the waterfall because it's really pretty. And that's what you do. Um, but here I was shooting a little puddle at this waterfall and got one of my favorite shots. And if I wasn't in that mentality to explore and shoot the light that was calling to me, I wouldn't have gotten this shot that I really connected to. You know, like like Alex was saying, like so many people, you know, focus on what we should do and what we've been taught to do. And, you know, we, we kind of put ourselves in this little box, but there is a world of photography outside of that box. If you just let yourself fail and just prioritize the experience over the photo you know, once you start doing that, you're going to start finding things that you like and you'll start to refine those things you like. You know, I, I've been shooting water for, you know, when I look back in my portfolio, I see water shots from 
2014, 2015, and they sucked. They sucked so bad. You know, I had no clue what worked and what didn't work. I just knew that like, oh, that's the light is hitting this water there and I'm going to take a picture of it. I'm like, oh, that's kind of neat, but not a photo that I would release. But every time I would go out, it would keep, I would keep noticing it. So I'd keep shooting it. And eventually, you know, you start to learn what works and what doesn't work visually. Um, but if I didn't let myself take those crappy photos, then, you know, I wouldn't have developed this love of water that I have. I would have just put a stop to it because you're not supposed to shoot direct light on water. You know, don't shoot waterfalls in the middle of the day or when it's, when it's sunny or in direct light. But most of my waterfall shots are when it was direct light or a really sunny day. So, you know, I think when we start throwing out rules of what we should and shouldn't do, you know, especially to new, new people, um, it just kind of creates a box that they put themselves in and they're less likely to explore their creative side and what calls to them. Uh, uh, DJ, uh, Alex, there's a question coming up. I think it's very relevant for you guys. Subhadeep and Puneet, they're asking this on YouTube. Now, when you, get, when you guys go to a scene, Grand Vista, I, I've been to Abiqua, right? DJ, and you just spoke about it. Somehow, uh, you figured out that small minimalistic window which you wanted to train your lens on, and you did that. Same mm -hmm. for Alex as well. You've got like multiple shots of very intimate, minimalistic scenes. Now, is it because you guys have been there, done the grand vistas at those locations, and now basically trying to find something more? Would you operate the same if we left you, let's say, the Dolomites, maybe, mm -hmm. right? Uh, because it's, yeah. so, how yeah. do you figure out the small, intimate scenes that you guys project to us? TJ, do you mind if I share my screen? No, go for it. I've got, I've got the thing I was going to show actually is right up the alley. Um, let's see. Ah, can't get this zoom out of the way. All right. Yeah. So here's a grand scene. This is uh, your standard mountain lake. Right, it's a beautiful place. I, I was camping here with my girlfriend and a couple of friends. Um, we had a great time here. It was beautiful. I, I love this place. But this photo, which I just took for documentation, just to remember what it looked like there, this is not an interesting photo, in my opinion. This is like anyone could take this photo. Anyone stands there, they'll take the same shot, right? It's just the reflection. I even cut off the trees in the lower left. I screwed it up. I mean, I just... <laughs> It's, it's a boring shot. There's nothing there that, that says anything about me as a person, what I found interesting about the scene. It's just, that's what was there. And so I think I have these examples that I like to show of uh, ways that I found these smaller scenes within a grand landscape. And so one of my favorite shots came out of this scene. And what I really liked was just the way these trees were catching light against this Alex? backdrop here. Oh, yeah. Sanctuary, this is where you shot it? Sanctuary. Uh, no, you'll see in a sec. So uh, these trees, <laughs> I, 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 I love the way they were catching light against this backdrop. And so that's what I focused on this evening instead of this grand scene, which is the obvious shot. And it would have looked like a postcard. It would have looked like anyone else's shot. It wouldn't have been mine. But the shot that I found was Kindred Spirits. It's a... Uh, it's just about the trees and the light. It's about the thing that drew me to the scene and the thing that I found interesting. And so I think this is representative of how I operate in general with my photography is I try to focus on what I found interesting and try to make something that excludes the context and makes you wonder. Like these trees, I, if you saw the mountain scene, you don't have any questions, right? In this big scene here you don't have any questions as to what was going on here. It's a mountain lake, it's near sunset, it's kind of golden hour, blue skies. You, there's nothing to make you think there. It just is. And then when you drill it down to a smaller element like this and kind of exclude the context of the sky and, and the rest of the scene, then you start to wonder about these trees and their character and why they're so curled and how the light is hitting them. I get a lot of questions about the light on this image. I mean, that's pretty much the same light except I walked around to the other side of the lake. So it was more backlight than sidelight. But 
Um, I just really like to drill down a scene to its essential element that caught my eye. So I can show another example here. So this was just while I was hiking in Yellowstone. Um, it's kind of a drab day. You can see the light was kind of diffused by the clouds, just gray. It was like 11 a.m. It's not the time that you're supposed to be shooting, right? It's not sunrise or sunset. Um, but I saw the way this this uh, geyser was interacting with these trees back here. And so I ended up making another of my favorite images there, Apparition. And I just, I like to pick out elements of the scene that I find most interesting. And I find that the final result is a lot more mysterious than the original scene was. And also it's not as reliant on great conditions or finding an epic location. It's more about so focusing on the details. Um, what was the original question? I want to make sure I'm not getting too off track. Well, I think you nailed it. Um, it's about how do you get into grand vistas and then find the small intimate arrangements? Yeah, well, I think the, the typical approach here, you know, if you were looking for a wide angle scene might be to walk over to the river here on the left and use the river as a leading line. And then you'd have this uh, these trees kind of terminating your horizon at the upper third and then you'd have a third of sky up above that and you'd wait for sunrise or sunset and get some color over it and then process it very dramatically and I, I just that wouldn't look like my photo that would be what anyone was inclined to do if they were there I wanted to focus on what I thought was interesting and and I guess the way that I drill that down is if you look at your big scene, is there some detail in it that you love? Like, is there the way that the light is hitting the mountain? Is that what you love about your giant scene? Or is it like the way the light's reflecting off the river in the foreground? Or is it just some little bit of fog in the midground? Like, what is that detail that you love? Why not make a photo about that instead of expecting your audience to notice this detail among all these other things? Why not make the photo about the thing that you love? So. That's kind of my approach in general, and I think that's why I go for the small scenes. Not only are they more unique to me, like no one's going to go copy these images, um, but they're also uh, Next, more mysterious. Sorry for interrupting. And, can, can you stay back at the previous image? I, I have one question. <laughs> yeah, let me go back. Oh. I'm, Sorry, I'm, there we I, go. This one here? Yeah, yeah. So now um, I have I have one question. Now you have an interesting thought process here, which is which is uh, you know, kind of an eye opener for mo most of us. Now when you when you are hiking like here or or anywhere else, or you're you're just walking, um, do you first click the wide angle and then figure out what to do, or you always have this telephoto looked in uh, logged into the camera and uh, with your eyes you visualize that this is the scene that everybody would be clicking and you zoom into something and then create then and there itself because uh, that is where is uh, the differentiator that you wanted to create how does it go what is the thought process and how do you really visualize that um well first i just i don't pull out a camera at all i think a lot of my workshop students are surprised to see how long it takes me to pull out the camera They're like why isn't your camera out well i'm just looking i'm finding the shot you can't just take it out and start snapping you're not going to make a good photo if you're just pointing at things without thinking about it or feeling it so i don't even pull out the camera i do often have my phone because it's so convenient to pull out the phone and just pinch zoom and you can kind of frame something up really quickly put a rectangle around something and see if there's if if it's going to work compositionally uh, so i use the phone a lot i actually don't really like using the wide angle on the camera for that reason. It's kind of hard to zoom into a precise composition, whereas on the phone you can pinch zoom and you have granular control. On the camera it's like 5x or 10x zoom, you know, it's not uh, exact framing. So I don't use the wide angle. I don't even put on the right lens until I kind of determine what it is I'm going to be shooting and where I'm going to be standing. Um, but I just, I just kind of look for what's interesting to me. If something catches my eye and would compel me to pull out the camera, I still don't pull it out yet. I start framing it up on the phone and see if I can come up with a composition that's going to work because it's a it's a pain to pull out the camera and put it on the tripod and 
I don't even put it on the tripod right away because then you're just putting yourself in a box. You're locking yourself into that perspective. So I like to just kind of play around with perspective, move around, check out how things line up if I'm standing over here, over there. And, and then eventually I'll pull out the camera when I have an idea of what, what I want to shoot. And here I just, I thought everything was lining up here. I didn't want to, uh, I, I couldn't really move over anymore because then this tree would start blocking the scene. So I, I kind of was locked into where I had to stand already. Um, and so then I knew I needed the telephoto to frame it. That's Does that answer the question? Yeah, thank you. Thank you so much. That, that's, that's wonderful insight, yeah. Yeah, so here, <laughs> uh, this, these are just the photos that I happen to have from my favorite images. I guess I was having a gas station snack. I was living on the road for a few weeks at a time here, but uh, that's why that's there. <laughs> I just saw this tree off in the distance and I made one of my favorite images there too. And wow. the theme on all of these is just that I'm excluding context, right? I'm not showing you the hills behind the tree or the, the dirt road and the campground. I'm not showing you the fact that I'm standing by the side of the road or any of this gravel here. I'm not showing you the other trees. I'm just focusing in on what I think is going to work the best for the photo and excluding everything else. And, the photo is a lot more mysterious than the original scene. So, yeah, and I think I, I think another another question that I have in mind is that: Are you trying to? Did you um, deliberately start uh, avoiding scenes which are too obvious to everybody, and, and um, which is which probably you yeah. think is not going to be obvious at all? I think that that has to do with my progression in general as an artist, where I started out shooting basically emulating the people that I looked up to, like TJ alluded to before, like I would just, um, I'd see these guys shooting these awesome scenes in the Pacific Northwest, which is where I just moved. And I'd want to go shoot my version of that. So I'd go shoot the same thing, but I'd, you know, shoot it at twilight and put some stars above it or do my own processing on it. Or I would happen to get different light, but it wasn't really my photo. It was just their photo with different light or different processing. Um, so I got bored with that after a couple of years and I really didn't feel like the photos were mine. I didn't feel proud of them. I just felt like oh, I'm just going and taking other people's photos. I want them to be mine. So that's really what started me down this road is wanting images I could call my own unique to me. So it's, it's taking these big scenes. I mean, this was a beautiful, uh, morning. I think I was with TJ afternoon i don't remember what time that was um yeah and we were uh we were on a road trip we just this was a beautiful place but i didn't really know how to distill it down into an interesting photo because i thought that all this snow and, and brush was kind of junky the trees didn't really stand out it didn't make sense as a photo to me but then i saw the way the light was working back here on these layers and kind of picked this photo out of the bigger landscape that's amazing because I think here, you're talking about light being the main compositional element here, probably. Yeah, light, light sometimes forms the composition. I mean, I think I get asked a lot, what's more important, composition or light? I think they're both equally important, probably, because the light will often make or break your composition. Yeah. Um, like here, this whole scene, uh, this is actually where I live. I live in a trailer, and we travel full time. So I shot this from my dinette i shot this from where i eat breakfast and uh the thing is i made an epic photo out of it because i was excluding all the context of the rest of the sky and and the gravel campsite that i was parked in and i'm just showing you what was interesting to me which was the way the clouds were playing on this one peak so i think it's a very powerful technique to make a photo that can't easily be replicated and maybe has a sense of mystery too and there, there's one more thought that just came to my mind. Do you do you feel that by doing this, by moving away from wide angle, you are also moving away from those complications of focus stacking and foreground elements? <laughs> yeah, that's nice. That's nice <laughs> about it. I think that um, focus stacking with a wide angle, I actually, when I pull out a wide angle, what I think is, oh, that's nice. I have all the depth of field in the world because I'm not getting two inches away from my subject. 
that's the thing with the wide angle is there's this tendency to get really close to I'm sorry, Ted, I know <laughs> you might be showing a photo that's exactly this, but you get really close to uh, some subject and it becomes very dominant. And it's also so close to your lens, you need to start focus stacking and then it becomes a very technical venture. I think Ted does it better than anyone, by the way. Uh, but um, I just, I like to, I like to simplify the scenes and usually the the issue with focus or uh, depth of field for me is just that I'm using a long focal length. If something happens to be close, then I might have to stack a couple frames. But yeah, I like to avoid that. <laughs> it's a lot of work. I think this one was at f22 because even though that those dunes are very far away there, um, wow. it was it was still uh, it was still not quite enough depth of field at f16. So you still run into those issues here. But yeah, it's not. It's not like you're following the process to a T anymore. Like, okay, I have to get two inches away. I have to find my closest thing and my farthest thing. And then I need to take 16 shots at F8 and then blend them all together and then make an HDR out of it. Like it's a lot simpler to shoot this way too. So, yeah. So this, um, this whole scene, like I love the ripples in the foreground. I love these giant dunes, but I love being there, but I didn't think that it was an interesting photo. I think that what's interesting about the scene, which is, these giant dunes with all the little ones in front of it, that just gets lost if I take a wide angle shot here. So again, I just focus in on what I find interesting. And that's pretty much my philosophy. I think the resulting photos are more mysterious and uh, make you ask more questions than you would of a wide angle shot. So those are my examples. That's all I have. Alex, do you think it's also got to do something with the personality? You know, some people have a macro view of things. They like the bigger picture, while some people like more intimacy, the detail orientation. Do you think personality plays a part in choosing? Yeah, I think what the thing about my personality that makes me make these kinds of images, um, I guess here's another one that you were asking about, Sanctuary, yes, yes. Um, is I want to make images that I feel enveloped in. I want to feel like I'm transported to another place and like a specific mood is is being given to me. I'm being made to feel a specific thing. So if I include the whole scene, I don't really know what to feel, except uh, that's a beautiful place. I'd like to be there. But here, like I start thinking all about the forest and, and the mystery of the forest and um, being enveloped in green. And I just, I want to be made to feel something like that when I look at an image. So I think my personality is that I'm kind of introverted and I like to um, I like to be cozy. I don't like to be out in the open very often. I just feel like I like to feel safe and secure. And I feel like I get that from some of my photos too. I just want to feel wrapped up in that scene. Yes, yes. This is a very interesting, uh, ever since I've been looking at your website, this image has been really catching my attention. And this is such a beautifully composed, very well seen image. And 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 you mentioned something uh, right now. You said that while you were clicking with uh, wide angle, uh, you felt that this image is not yours. This could be anybody else's uh, who mm -hmm. was there in the scene. Uh, but was it really this simple uh, uh, a thought to make you move from wide angle to telephoto and start composing and creating stunning images or what was the thought process that oh, it took it took years and i should mention ted and tj were with me for this and they didn't see this shot and they're great photographers they're great artists they were hiking and i was just looking at my feet and i saw this thing and i made them wait for like an hour while i shot this we were on our way out um it's just a, it's a good worried. example what's that we're pretty, yeah. we're, we're pretty worried about you yeah because yeah, there was a, there were uh we were in a rainforest where there are black bears and so we had these whistles so we could whistle to each other if we needed help didn't you have codes like long yeah, short we had a code. We had, it was yeah it was like it was, it was almost like morse code um where we like had different different whistles for like hey there's something cool over here or you know i need help or i'm okay or are you okay yeah. I, think they were, like, I don't even think minutes. i whistled at you though i just went silent as soon as yeah, i saw yeah. this i started <laughs> shooting it but uh ted and tj walked DJ, you were, were going to try to what? I think we were going to try to prank you when you're. Well, we did. Yeah, we were like, he was a. 
Well, there was the one time where uh, Alex was using the bathroom. And it was the same he, trip. Yeah, and, and Ted, <laughs> Ted like walked up and started like snapping oh, yeah. around him. And Alex is like, Ted, is that you? And Ted didn't like say anything. So Alex so was I like, thought it hey, was bear. a bear. Yeah, he was trying to scare a bear away and the branches just kept cracking. So I think and, uh, Alex ended up running off with his pants around his ankles. Yeah, <laughs> you got me. But I got uh, the photo. No, I mean, it's it's just a, it's it's a perfect example of like why this kind of photography produces results that are unique to you. I mean, like, Ted and TJ didn't see this shot. I did. They're great artists. They should be able to see. But in that time, that was my mindset. I was like obsessed with the ferns and obsessed with the forest floor. And I was looking the whole time we were hiking and I saw it. And that's, uh, I think that's pretty much what you asked, right? Yeah. yeah. I think there's, there's one question um, I, I, that, that would be an extension of what we are just uh, talking about now. This is by Rajan Datta. Does shooting alongside friends make a difference in how you compose and do you guys discuss frames and composition or each other looks for their for his own? I think you pretty much answered that, but still specific to this particular question here. Well, depends on whether you're shooting the same subject or not. I mean, we just kind of like with most of my friends, we just go to a place and then we spread out and find our own shit. So we don't <laughs> we don't. Uh, stand and shoot the same thing most of the time although i think i do have a photo of us all shooting this one tree from the same trip but uh that was just a really cool subject what do you think tj do we you're the only one who put that yeah. shot out i think we all have it though <laughs> yeah we all have it but alex alex beat, uh, beat us to the chase but i think weren't you the one that actually saw the tree alex or was that ted i'm ted's the one that saw the tree but i saw that comp i didn't know that ted i didn't know what his comp was of it or if you even think, shot it. You know, like, then this, <clears throat> I didn't get a single thing from this trip. Like, I don't even have any, like, potentials I I that I want to work on. So, you know, I I wasn't used to, um, I wasn't comfortable shooting, where did you guys go? You guys disappeared. I wasn't comfortable shooting force then, and I was very overwhelmed. And, you know, I was, I think I was still, trying to see everything with a wide angle and I wasn't used to shooting with a telephoto and isolating all the simplicity and all that chaos. So it was very overwhelming because you're, when you're walking, walking through a forest and you're looking for a photo, you know, you try really hard. So I was looking at all these wide scenes and I couldn't find anything and I'm getting like overwhelmed with all this wide. And I'm like, Oh crap, I'm not even looking for the small scenes. So then you like start looking for the small scenes and then you're like, well, what big scenes am I walking past? And you kind of get in this like, this battle visually where you're like, do I pay attention to the big stuff or the small stuff, the big stuff or the small stuff. But it's just like, you know, when you are trying to find a photo, um, at least for me, that's the, the battle that I get into where I'm trying to, you know, I just get very overwhelmed. But if I throw all that away and I'm just like, I don't care if I get a photo. And if I see something, it's usually a play of light or a pattern or a texture. If I see something that calls to me, then I'll spend time with it. And if I get a photo, cool. If not, you know, no big deal. But, you know, I think uh, yeah. that's, you know, yeah, I was just very visually overwhelmed on that trip. I wasn't used to shooting forests at all. And, you know, now yeah. that I've kind of done a lot of exploring with photography and thinking about it, I've gotten a lot more comfortable at shooting photos. And it all comes down to approaching it from connecting and not going out and be getting a photo itself. Ted has a really good shot from that trip. Yeah. I think um, your collection um, in Winter Waste at Ted, um, sorry, TJ, um, that was, you know, that's one of my favorite of all, you know, all of your collections and themes. So you. You know, Winter in Waste uh, gallery of your website, it's, it's, you know, full of amazing scenes, bright, happy uh, moments and intimate too. So what, which one is your most favorite of that collection? And all of my, all of them are my favorite. And if you want to talk about any one of them, which one would be your, which one, that one sort? Let's it's see. Uh, relevant to the conversation too, that TJ and I were together for that whole trip and we have completely different photos yes, for the most part. Of, we have a couple of same ones. I have some images to show from there. Uh, you have it right now with you, Alex? Here, let's see. Can you see my screen? Yeah. 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 All right. I'm uh, currently redoing my website, so um, 
Let's see. So this is uh, my Winter in the West collection, I call it. And this is, uh, these are images from the trip that Alex and I, and it was about a month long trip, maybe like just under a month that we were on the road. And we initially left Portland and drove to Yellowstone or Grand Teton National Park, met up with some friends and then went to Yellowstone National Park and uh, got stranded there because there was a big snowstorm. And then we continued on down through Utah and then over to Death Valley. And then we had a workshop in Death Valley and then back to Portland. So, you know, this trip, um, it was the first time that I'd really like been on the road for that long and just like immersed in photography. Um, no responsibilities necessarily to think of just kind of like we went where the wind blew us. Um, so it was a, it was just a very soulful trip for me. And I learned a lot about myself as a photographer. And, you know, I think, you know, Alex and I, we've always been really good friends, but I think on that trip, spending all that time together, we um, really kind of solidified that, you know, and just kind of um, honed our relationship a little bit. So, you know, this is a wide variety of different images, you know, it's winter um, and a lot of it. And then, you know, but they're all, so there's a lot of white and a lot of, you know, I went a lot really high key with a lot of stuff because that's just kind of where I'm trying to go with my images now. Like, you know, when I'm in nature, I'm happy. I'm not like dark and dramatic and, and gloomy. And, you know, that's not what's in my heart. So I try to just kind of go a little bit brighter with my images. Um, so I have, you know, a lot of winter stuff. And then as you start getting, getting down here, it's more Death Valley. So th this is more of like a Death Valley area. But even in Death Valley, I was still able to find white. Okay. Um, and then we so went back to the same trip. What's that? So most of the photos were taken in the same trip. Are that's what you were saying? Yeah, these were all taken on the same trip. The only one that was not taken on the same trip, it was taken just like a, a month before, is this one right mm -hmm. here. And this was taken actually in Olympic National Park. Mm -hmm. um, okay. In in the Ho Rainforest, so a lot of people, or along the Ho River near the Ho Rainforest, a lot of people think of the Ho Rainforest as this really green place with moss hanging from the trees, and just like it feels like. You know, this is basically the same place my green shot was. It's pretty oh, close. Yeah. It's so it's, it's a like, different you know, rainforest, but it's like fifty miles away, thirty miles. Right. I don't so know. so yeah, then you know, but along the river you have all these alders, and we were you know this was in January. My girlfriend and I were on a trip, so yeah, we went to a rainforest in in the winter, you know, when it's not lush and I mean it's still lush obviously, but it's not as lush. You don't have like all the the understory that's green, and you know the, there aren't leaves on the trees. But, you know, we were just driving along the river and we saw all these you know, river trees. It's just, it's just this texture um, standing up against each other. And that, that's what really drew me to it. So that's the only image that's not from that trip per se. Um, okay. uh, I would have never noticed this one. I mean, I mean, I never even imagined, I didn't even remember that I even, you know, this could have been there in front of me in last February when I drove up to, you know, Horan Forest. That's amazing. Yeah, and you know, and it's it wasn't very apparent, but you know, I had my two hundred to five hundred millimeter lens on, and kind of like what Alex was talking about, like isolating the things that are really calling to you. Like I looked across the river, and I just saw all this this immense amount of texture. Like I love patterns and texture, and like when you view this image, you know, full screen or like high resolution, it's all texture. It's about the texture. Um, so you have these, you know, kind of like bigger. Um, this lower frequency detail in like the big giant tree trunks that are standing out against all of this, like all back here, it's, if you zoom in, it's just like tons of tiny little branches. So I tried to make it all about the texture and, and just like a simple color palette because that's basically what it was because it was winter. Um, but my favorite, I think you asked about my favorite shot of all this, right? Is probably, yeah. uh, I mean, I. This is I, this is one of my favorite connections. I, I I'm really connected to a lot of these. I I really like this shot here. Together, no matter what. Um, Olympic national or that was an uh, not Olympic uh, Yellowstone National Park. Alex and I were actually together when we took this walking side by side, and I just saw these kind of two trees that were hanging out in the middle of this snowy field, um, just being isolated. It was really cold. It was like, you know, what like zero deg degrees Fahrenheit. That was cold. Yeah. Yeah, it was cold. Um, so yeah, I just uh, I love this uh, this double draw. It's a little bit more aggressive. It's not as uh, um, calming to me as the other ones, but 
it still does have that sense of calm just because it's high key and really minimalistic. Um, I love Departed. These are just, I mean, and these aren't like heavily processed. These are just like dead tree snags that were kind of like um, hanging out in the mist. And not most of these, I would say probably all of these are telephoto shots in this whole entire collection. I don't think I have any, oh, this is a wide angle right here, Soul Flame. That's a wide angle. That is the only wide angle shot in this whole entire uh, collection. But this is my favorite shot here, I think. And I'd shot this. A couple years in a row, actually, Ted and I did a workshop the year before I shot this um, in the Death Valley in Eastern Sierra, and I shot the same exact composition, but it, I had just, I had never shot with a 200 to 500 millimeter lens before, and the... Uh, it wasn't until you had me around for inspiration that you really nailed <laughs> well, it. Well, I just, I wasn't used to, um, you know, dealing with depth of field. So I think I probably shot this at like F11 or F16, but I was also at 500 millimeters. So a lot of the things were out of focus and I just said it was, it was really soft. And, you know, what I loved about this photo was again, the texture in it. Like there's a lot of really high, high frequency texture and having some of that soft uh, didn't, didn't really communicate what I was really drawn to the scene about it. Um, so the next year when I was there with Alex and I did a workshop, I was lucky to have like the same, you know, it's, it's a clear sky. So this is all just depending on the, the, the sun coming up behind the mountain and kind of like back lighting all of this foliage and these trees. So, you know, if you're there at this time of day, you're going to get this kind of light if you have a clear sky and, you know, most of the times we do have clear skies um, when I'm around. Uh, but I just loved the way that, you know, the, the, it kind of like the composition kind of came up this way and then there's this little wedge of yellow here and everything is just getting this backlight against this dark hill and I took my time with it and made sure that I focused that and got everything sharp so that I could have the uh, the photo how I wanted it and then the next year when we went back again the same kind of light but all of these grasses had changed like I don't know if they had gotten cut down or if a windstorm came through or the river flooded and knocked them all over, but this comp wasn't as pleasing. It didn't have this, this wedge of yellow and this kind of like this leading line here that, that really uh, made it stand out. But, you know, this photo has two of my favorite things, texture and light together. So like, that's why I really like this photo. And when I print it um, on a really nice paper that reflects light really well, this image, it glows. It like feels like it's illuminated and like, you know, glowing at you. So, you know, there are a lot of things I really like about this image. You know, the fact that it called to me two years in a row and I spent some time with it, you know, like going back the next year, I was familiar with it. It's like a friend, you know, and that's kind of like how I think of my photography, you know, how many, you know, like, it's building that, like I talk about building that relationship, you know, like think about how many trees you drive past or walk past in your life, you know, and how many of them you forget, but there are trees that you remember, right? Like all of us have trees that we can think of, of when we were younger um, or even just now that when we go past this tree, we notice it and we look at it and it's because we are familiar with it and we're, we have a relation, it's calling to us for some reason. So when it's calling to us, we spend time with it in a mental way or an emotional way. Um, it's just really pleasing. So, you know, that's when I go back to places that are just maybe like these anonymous places, but it has this tree that I spent time with. Like I recognize that tree, you know, when Ted and Alex and I were on that uh, Olympic National Park trip, that backpacking trip, remember guys when we were at the campsite and we were like looking up and I saw that. It was, it was almost like a hole in the canopy of the trees that looked like a heart. You guys remember yeah, that? Yeah. And I took pictures of it and you guys were making fun of me. But every year when we go back to that campsite, I look up and that heart is there. So it's like, it's this familiar, familiarity um, that, I've, that, I, that I get with the places that I shoot. So when I go back, I can say like, you know, like it's almost like an old friend and I can photograph it in different conditions. I can photograph this in, you know, I think then we did this uh, workshop in... Uh, so this was, when was, this is, this was winter, right, Alex? No, this was February. Winter this was in the February. West. Yeah. So this, no, this was a February trip. Um, but then when we did our November workshop, some of these still had leaves on it. 
So I got to see it, you know, an old friend in a different environment. So, um, yeah, it's, a. Uh, yeah, I just, I just, I really enjoy like the developing like, those relationships. So one question, TJ, uh, I think the only image that I really found similar in both uh, yours and Alex's portfolio, I think is Chosen and Conclave, shot in Yellowstone. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I have them both pulled up if you want me to. Uh, so, uh, share the look, screen. It's the same tree. It's the same tree, right? Yeah. What's that? Uh, yeah, that's the same tree. Right. So was it the same trip? Yeah, that was the same trip. So I exactly. had this shot and TJ had what? Huh. This one? Yeah. yeah. But we'd shot it at different times. We weren't even together that day. We just walked by the same tree and saw it at different times. That's why he has different I, light. I broke the trail to that, that tree, so you're welcome. <laughs> oh, yeah. It was so difficult snowshoeing like 20 feet off the trail. It was really hard. It was. It was. It was really deep snow. It was easier for you when the trail was broken, wasn't it? Yeah. But I, I didn't ask you us, to break it. I think all of us on that uh, trip shot that tree. Like, yeah. you know, the other friends that we were with. Because it was like, it was, it, it was it's kind like, of, yeah. it was kind of like an obvious shot, you know. And when I was there, yeah. uh, the, you know, again, it's, you know, late morning, early afternoon. Um, we shot this one together, too. But all of that, that's not fog. That's uh that's steam from a nearby nearby thermal pools. So it was just kind of m moving through the scene and playing with the trees and everything and also diffusing the light. So, you know, I think I had a clear sky when I shot it and Alex had a little bit flatter light. Um, yeah, mine was, yeah, it was diffused, but they're different, yeah. Hey, what about Ted? Yeah, Ted, yeah, what you about to say? <laughs> <laughs> Ted, show us your shot from here. Not here. There. From where? Yellowstone. Uh, I'm just joking. No. You weren't with us. No. no, I wasn't there. You guys didn't invite me. <laughs> you wouldn't have come anyway. <laughs> nice. How do I stop? Have... How do I stop sharing? Up at the top oh, of your screen. Okay. Yeah. okay. That was so wonderful, guys. So I think uh, I think uh, now moving on to Ted. Uh, Ted has been. Uh, patiently watching and looking at these images and uh, so, so Ted, um, there is a lot to ask you but I think the, the, the best thing is to uh, to let you go and, and show us your images and, and maybe talk about it, the stories behind them and, and we all know you and identify you as, as someone who does some iconic post processing as well so probably if you can give us some tips on that as well so um, over to you now and, and take us iconic in the sense that Ted made it iconic. <laughs> I, should well, say. I don't know about that. Yeah. I, at first I was, I was, uh, Alex was one of the, the people who inspired me in terms of processing. Um, and did we ever, I, do know, a I, Skype? I think what's that? Did we ever do a Skype? Um, no, I don't think so. Okay. Yeah. But, but I just, um, I mean, just, just, you know, just seeing your, how your images looked inspired, um, me for that. I mean, um, you know, I would say like in terms of, um, advice about processing, like the way I got started was really, I was uh, emulating other people. I mean, it was, it was Mark Adamus, Ryan Dyer and Alex were pretty much the, um, main people that were inspiring me and through the process of like, you know, trying to break down what they were doing and, and honestly trying to copy them to a degree. Um, I, I began to get more comfortable with processing and from that kind of develop my own style. And it, it was almost, it wasn't even really intentional. It just kind of happened because we all have like, um, you know, little ways that we naturally do things that are going to differ from anybody else. And all those things added together are, are going to make your shots um, look different. I think um, when you get to a certain place and uh, as you get more comfortable with processing in general, but um, yeah, I don't know. Uh, well, it's some photos. Yeah. Sure. Well, one thing I actually wanted to um, to talk about was um, 
before you were asking the question about, you know, when you're shooting with friends, like how do you, um, I don't, I don't remember what the question was, but like, how do you distinguish yourself or. Yeah. So know, do you compliment each other. Do you discuss your compositions and yeah, yeah. The difference and. Yeah, actually I wanted to, um, can you guys see this? Yeah. Yeah. Can. So <clears throat> I wanted to show this actually because um, I was with TJ when I shot this and the whole reason I have this shot is because of TJ. So I was actually walking, this is uh, Oneonta Gorge in Oregon. And um, I was walking out of the gorge and um, TJ was at this spot and he kind of was messing around with his camera low down to the water. And I was kind of like, oh, what are you doing there? And I saw what he was doing, which was getting really low and, and capturing the reflection of the light in the water. So, um, you know, I decided to start playing around with it too. And this is the shot I ended up with, which is one of my favorite shots. And, um, you know, I have him to thank really for, I guess, starting the idea or, or getting me to thinking about that. So I think it's just, um, you know, goes to show that, you know, you don't necessarily need to um, shy away from whatever your friends are doing and like, just cause you, you don't want to copy them or you don't want to end up with the same shot. Um, you can really kind of lean into that and, you know, you never know, it might lead to something else um, that is distinctly you. So. Yeah. And that tree shot we were talking about earlier that I posted and you guys didn't, I, when found that because you mentioned there was some interesting tree over there. Yeah. Right. I so, mean, I didn't like go shoot your shot, but like without you, I wouldn't have found it. It's, it true. can be helpful to have people around. <clears throat> I think so. There, uh, is, there is an answer that everybody feels that though you might have a different style of shooting, but you do observe each other and what they are doing and probably try and look at what the other is doing and find another composition for it. Yeah, I, I think, you know, more and more, um, like, I, I do value um, being out with my friends and, you know, my girlfriend is a photographer too, and we frequently shoot together. Um, but more and more, I just, I really like just going out and just kind of being on my own and not not necessarily having that influence of seeing what they're looking at, you know. Um, but, you know, I, my girlfriend, with, who I shoot the most with, you know, we go to the same place and we come away with completely different shots because we're both viewing it in our own way. Um, but yeah, there are certainly times where we play off of each other. I had actually, I have Ted to thank for my, uh, my shot from Upper Butte Creek um, with the green waterfall the forest kind of around it and there's like a little window of the waterfall like I, we had found that shot with a client but i shot it long telephoto at first and you know ted shot it with a wide angle and i was like "Ooh, i kind of like that so i shot that one so i kind of stole, stole his idea and then he stole my idea so yeah it's a lot of stealing <laughs> it's a lot of stealing back and forth and then we just resent each other um deep down and hold it's it true, cool. true. <laughs> but no it's uh i mean yeah like we there's de it's definitely, you know, and Alex and I, you know, so Ted and I see things, I think we interpret the landscape in very different ways. Um, and Alex and I are probably a little bit more similar in the way that we interpret the landscape. So when Ted and I go somewhere, the shots that we come away with are pretty, pretty different. And when Alex and I go somewhere, we often have very similar compositions. Um, and we focus, we kind of like see the same way. And we see the same we, thing and then I come up with the composition and TJ copies it and man, it's... <laughs> or, or um, Alex just gets the better composition because he, he gets the better spot first. I'm like, crap, it would be better if I was over there. But then it's like, I'm basically interlocking tripod legs. But, but no, it, it's, it's, it's fun shooting with friends, but I think I do the best when I'm just kind of in my own flow state and most of my best photos are alone yeah 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 and i think I that one the one where i was with them they were way up the trail like i was pretty much alone so i think if i had them hanging over me i wouldn't make the same shot 
Stop hanging over me, Ted. <laughs> so um, I think, Ted, um, you have a couple of, you know, lots of iconic sorts from Patagonia, and uh, we would like to hear from those sorts of Patagonia. Okay. You... Um, yeah, I was actually going to share, um, let me pull it up here, this shot here. Um, there's actually a really funny story. It's one of my favorite stories from um, any shot that I've taken. And we read about uh, that. What's that? It's a very brave story, Dad. It's a pretty brave story. Oh, so you already know it. Yeah, but we would like to hear it again from your okay. own <laughs> mouth again. <laughs> well, it's it's um, well, it's it's one of the the things I love about landscape photography is because a lot of times the story, the, the photos come with a story. Um, and a lot of my photos have really interesting stories. This one's one of my favorite and actually involves TJ. But um, so I, I was here in Patagonia. I was, I was there solo and I was camping in the uh, campground nearby here. And the night before this shot, I'm sitting in my tent and all of a sudden I start hearing this like I don't even know how to describe the noise. It was like a barking mixed with a growl mixed with a dinosaur um, moving around the, the campsite. And eventually I had three of whatever creatures it was surrounded my tent and were making this noise um, just, just kind of going around me. And I can, I can say it was literally the most scared I've ever been in my life. Um, and I had a, I had a little um, satellite, messaging device so i was messaging tj what i was messaging you right yeah yeah you were like you're like uh google patagonia night animal terror or something yeah it's like i was like i was like what i was like are you dying or something because you know it's it's like one of those where you have to like when you want like c you have to hit the letter two three times so it was like yeah. really hard for him to type and i think he had a limited number of characters um, or no, you had to move around on the screen for each letter, like through the Yeah, alphabet. so it took me a really long time to, to you know, type up every message. Um, so it was just very, yeah, it was so just very he's Googling, vague. trying to figure it out. And I think the only thing you could come up was, with was like either some bird or, or the, um, the big cat there. Was it, is it a puma? Yeah, something like I can't like remember. That. Yeah, there's a big cat that's in the area. So I'm, I'm sitting there thinking that, you know, I've got this like puma or whatever it was three of them surrounded me in my tent and they're going to murder me. Um, but um, so yeah, eventually they, they went away and um, a couple hours after that, I fell asleep and then I got up the next morning and took this, but um, I had actually not planned on shooting this. I, I planned to go to a different location um, to shoot. And I went there first, um, but ended up just not feeling it. And um, almost at the last, you know, moment I decided to try and go over to the lake here. Um, and this is Cerro Torre, which is one of the most famous mountains in Patagonia. Um, and there's this lake in front of it. And that night, the night before it had happened to, the temperature had happened to drop enough to just give the surface of the lake this thin layer of ice. And <clears throat> when I got over there, I started noticing that there were all these really cool line patterns forming uh, in the ice. And uh, unfortunately, I was under the pressure of time because you know I had made the mistake of going somewhere else to do another shot and decided that I didn't like that and came here. So when I got here, the um, the light on the mountain was pretty much like it is in in the um, in the shot, but I didn't have a composition yet. I hadn't found a foreground or anything. Um, so I actually just went ahead and shot this. Um, and after I shot that, I went hunting for my foreground um which was a little interesting in terms of um processing because well one thing i should note also is this is a um focal length blend so let me actually pull back to so this is the foreground i shot and you can see that the the light is a good bit later than the light as it was on the mountain um, in the final shot. But um, so the problem here is, and the problem you often see with wide angle lenses is that you get this distortion called pincushion distortion where it kind of takes things in the middle of the, of the lens and squishes them in just so it can 
you know, take that wide angle and, and fit it all into the frame. Um, and it's particularly bad at this location and just makes Cheritori look like this little, you know, nothing nub back in the background. Um, so, you know, obviously I didn't like that. Um, I don't think as a shot, this is very good because the, the mountain is just not very prominent. Um, so I decided to do a focal length blend and shoot the mountain at a longer focal length and then blend that in with the foreground. Um, and it was a little dicey because, you know, I'm, I'm working with a reflection here. So not only do I need to worry about the size of the mountain um, matching with the reflection, you know, in the lake, but I also need to worry about the light since the light that I shot on the mountain, which let me pull that up, <clears throat> was um, from a good bit earlier and looked a lot different. So, you know, I just, I had to, you know, pull some tricks out of the hat to, to make this work, to overcome the limitations of the camera, to overcome the limitations of um, my own mistakes that I made that morning. Um, but, you know, it, it, it a lot of people might have a problem with doing this kind of thing. And it kind of gets into the debate about post-processing. But um, my argument is that I was here and this was the experience I had. And it was a lot of effort to get here. Um, you know, I went through a night of terror to get here. And it's like, um, I'm not just going to give that up. Um, I would rather take some liberties with processing to create the the scene that um, I experienced. Um, so, fantastic way. Yeah. What's that? I think that's a wonderful way to put it. Yeah. Um, I'm trying to. <clears throat> Hold on a second here. Ted Gore, Photoshop master. Yeah. Sorry. I lost my uh, windows. Oh wait, here it is. <clears throat> so um, yeah, I mean, I, I I can walk you through what I did, um, you know, in terms of processing here. But basically, it was a, so I did a um, focus stack of the foreground, which is which was easy because it's it's just a flat you know sheet of ice. So you're not dealing with any um, objects that are overlapping. Um, so it was it was pretty simple focus stack of just like three images thrown together. Um, and I just really just did it manually on some masks, just, you know, manually painted in where the sharp areas were. Um, and did just a little bit of warping to, to get things in a better position. And then I blended in the background, which so when you do a focal length blend, the biggest thing you need to worry about is where you can transition from the, the foreground uh, layers to the background. And in this case, it was, it was pretty easy because I had you know, a nice uh, straight line of the shore of the lake to work with. Uh, so that's really where I transitioned from the front to back. And then I, I went around this rock here, which you know, wasn't a really big deal to trace that out. Um, so blended that in and um, brought in some more icebergs from, cause these were actually moving the entire time. So I brought them in from a previous shot where they were in a little bit of a better position. And um, let's see, somewhere here I had to do some color correction yeah, so here I had to do some color correction to match the light here, the color of it to the light on the mountain. So, you know, it doesn't it doesn't exactly match, but it's close enough. And the fact that it's a the ice uh, in the lake didn't make the reflection super clear, so it gave me a little bit of um, flexibility there to you know fudge that a bit. <clears throat> uh, let's see. And then something I do a lot is um, use transform warp just to kind of push things around slightly to, to get a overall, to get a composition feeling a little more, um, 
you know, just balanced. Uh, you can't do it too much because, you know, you'll start to soften up the pixels and stuff. But <clears throat> so that's pretty much it. Um, you had a, oh, well, you had I did, some light in the sky, right? Yeah. Yeah, I did. I did um, do some uh, creative stuff in the sky here by adding a bunch of light and just making it look more interesting. <clears throat> How did you get the patch on the sky, like emulating clouds? How did you get that? Uh, cloud brushes, actually. Okay. Um, I think, and I have, actually have a video for this. It's actually in the bundle um, that uh, TJ and Alex and I put together um, at a discounted rate for anybody who wants it. Um, but yeah, I just, you know, you can, you can pick up cloud brushes pretty much anywhere on Google. If you search for them, you can find lots of good ones. And, and actually um, the video, the video I include in this, I use uh, my own photo of clouds to make essentially a cloud brush or do the same thing, but on a dune shot, so. Oh, nice. <clears throat> yeah, so, you know, just, just really subtly tapped in, um, you know, different cloud brushes to just to give the, the area of light some texture. Um, and yeah, and the trick with cloud brushes is to not really brush with them. You don't want to, you know, do strokes because basically you're just going to lay down an image of a cloud and then drag it across the screen if you brush with it. So you just really want to just tap it in because that will just lay down uh, paint, um, you know, in the shape of the cloud in that one spot that you, that you tapped in. So, um, but yeah, and then just some final uh, color adjustments here at the end. And that's that. Ed, I do have a question. Uh, you know, more around, you know, your progression in photography. You started at, started at uh, as a chemical engineer. You studied chemical engineering, right? And then how did you gravitate towards graphics motion? Because I assume that's where you grew as an, you know, like as, as a creative artist. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, it's kind of crazy, like chemical engineering and motion graphics probably have, are like completely opposite ends of the spectrum. Um, but when I was in my final year of college, um, I mentioned it at the beginning of, of all this, but my roommate entered a short film contest and he recruited me to help. And we, we did that and we ended up winning actually. And um, we decided that after we graduated, which was not long after that, we were just going to start a video production business. Um, so we started doing that. And just in the process of doing video production, you know, we needed to put like text on the videos and whatnot. So um, I started getting into doing that kind of thing and learned about this whole industry called motion graphic design uh, and just got really super interested in it and, you know, picked up the software, which, um, you know, Mostly what's used for that is After Effects. You probably heard of After Effects. Um, and just started using After Effects a lot. And you know, I also needed to know how to use Photoshop and Illustrator and all the other Adobe programs. So just through the process of um, learning motion graphics, I learned all these other tools that were applicable to you know, post-processing. So you know, over time, when I got into doing this kind of stuff. It was, it was a really easy transition for me. I didn't really have to learn a lot in Photoshop just because I, I pretty much knew, um, I knew how to use it. Um, I didn't really know how to be creative with it in the way that I do now. So that, that was the big learning thing for me. Um, but yeah, having that foundation for motion graphic design definitely, I think gave me uh, an advantage to jump into this a lot quicker than maybe most people could. My second question was around uh, color theory. I mean, you, you are probably one of the most vocal proponents of color theory and context of nature, both, because you, you cannot have one in isolation, right? So yeah. uh, is this something that you studied or you found and then wrote about it? And also probably, Ted, if you get a chance, can you show us, uh, you know, like while you are composing or while you are post-processing, how can we find out uh, which color, uh, you, know, you know, basically pattern or palette uh, it subscribed to? 
Yeah. Well, I can't get too much into like the application of color theory because it's a, it's a really complicated topic and it would take me quite a while to really explain it. But, um, I do have the, the article online if people want to find that. And, and I'm actually, um, I've been working on some new processing videos and one of them actually is actually completely, uh, based on color theory for landscape photography. So, um, I have that coming out. Um, but, um, let's see, sorry. What was, what was your original question? <laughs> yeah. yeah. So again, color, uh, color theory, as well as context of nature, how did you come up with it? How did you come up? Oh, yeah. with it? So, um, with color theory, so when I got into motion graphic design, I actually went back to school and studied graphic design. Um, and color theories is a big deal, you know, in the graphic design world and the, and in the art world. Um, and as I got more into landscape photography, it started occurring to me that like, it's, it's really applicable. It's, it's all the same, you know, fundamentals that exist for graphic design. It's, it's pretty much the same thing. Um, so that's when I started thinking about it and, you know, trying to, um, you know, apply those theories to landscape photography. And the idea with context of nature is that, um, you know, the, the colors we, we go and photograph in nature, that's reality. Um, you know, we do have the freedom to change colors to whatever we want. I mean, in, in, in terms of art, you can do whatever you want, but, you know, when we're talking about landscape photography in particular, um, I think we could all agree that we, we try to keep things inside of a box. Um, and that box is really the reality of the nature that we shoot. And so the context of nature is, is just kind of an idea I came up with about keeping colors close to, you know, what you actually, what they actually are, because if you stray too far from that and you leave the context of nature, then what you might end up doing is, um, you know, making your shot look weird or, um, sorry, my phone's one second. <laughs> Is Ted's video frozen for you guys? Yeah, his yeah, phone is using, he's using his phone as a webcam. Oh, okay. Hold on, give me one second. Can you hear me still? Yeah. Yes, we can hear it. I'll see you. Hold on one second. You look better this way. <laughs> <laughs> I, a I little just, spinning circle. I just noticed that the chat on YouTube, that, uh, that's like people were talking on YouTube. I didn't know that. Yeah, that's where the chat is. They're not on Zoom. Okay. Can can you see me now? Yes. Yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. Unfortunately. <laughs> what, man? So yeah, I mean the concept of nature is just, I mean, it's just basically saying don't change the color so much that it doesn't look like how it did. It doesn't look plausible. Yeah. Rather. Not how um, it did, because you're right. And I mean the the I think the most um the example that I see the most and what I actually probably do the most is, is shifting like the blue in a sky more towards magenta. Um, you know, you don't, you never really see purple in a sky, like, you know, the color of the sky is never really purple, but um, you quite often see um, landscape photographs push towards purple. And for whatever reason we, we accept that and, you know, even though it is outside of the context of nature, but um, basically, you know, I mean, even in, in this image here, like the the blue in the sky is shifted a little bit more towards magenta, just to work a little bit better with the oranges. Um, so it's just that kind of thing, um, and it's just saying, you know, don't push it too far because eventually you get to a, a place where people will start thinking it looks weird. Any other questions? <laughs> I think we have to mesmerize with these images and, and the way you it's do it. Yeah, uh, now, um, 
so this entire process um, looks a little uh, complicated, at least at the time of clicking an image, because it requires a different level of visualization. And what kind of focal length would you choose for the mountains um, there? Uh, because if you if you mess it up here, probably then then uh, you're not going to get it right in the post processing as well. Am I right? I, this, I'm, uh, my question is first: is that am I right in my thought process right now? Why, what I'm asking in terms of doing like a focal length blend? Yeah, yeah. So you have to yeah, first I mean, right the, in the field itself. Yeah, um, it's well, it's I'm not sure how to like answer how to get it exactly right in the field. I mean, I shot this, so the foreground is shot at um, 14 millimeters, and then I think I shot the mountain at 35. Um, so it's it's just, you just kind of have to gauge it by your eye, how you think it's going to um, fit into the frame. Um, yeah, I mean, there's, there's no real technical way to go about it, I'd say. Okay. I think with experience and you have the eyes that you um, probably over a period of time you developed that vision. So yeah, yeah. And, I, and I mean, if if um, you know, if you have doubts about it, I mean, it's just one shot that you're taking of the mountain or whatever it is in the background that you're zooming in on. So take a few different ones at different focal lengths um, because then you'll have the um the options in photo in processing to figure out which one works best so some uh i wanted to mention some cameras have a double exposure feature and you could use that to kind of prototype a shot it wouldn't use it for the actual files but you shoot mm -hmm. one wide and one zoomed in to kind of lay the mountain over your shot and get an idea of how it's going to look but yeah it would just be for prototyping yeah. i think that's a good idea Alex. yeah that makes sense and, and uh, um, th there's another thing that I wanted to ask that uh, post-processing is one uh, area where most photographers mess up. Uh, they, they mess up not only with the complicated, they mess up at the beginner level of post-processing uh, also because they probably use the sliders way too much uh, in order to get the results way too fast. So there are certain tips that you would like to give. Um, um, do's and don'ts. Easy does it. Yeah. Um, yeah. I mean that, that is that is a good one. Is to 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 build. Um, you know, like you were saying. Yeah. You know, taking that one slider and just cranking it. Um, I think global adjustments, um, for the most part, are. I really don't recommend you know throwing global adjustments onto an image like, you know when you pull up your raw file, just cranking the contrast up. Um, I really like to work contrast in, um, you know, gradually uh, throughout the entire process. Um, and then also to, um, I try not to, when you're processing the raw file, to not push things too far before you get into Photoshop, because then you kind of back yourself into a corner um, you know, if you add a lot of contrast, a lot of saturation, and then you go into Photoshop, um, you know, then you only have there to build from unless you're working with, um, you know, smart objects, which is another tip yeah. I would give to always take your raw files into Photoshop as smart objects, because you can then open a smart object in Photoshop and go back into Adobe Camera Raw and adjust the raw settings on that layer. Um, so, and I often find that I have to go back and tweak something as I start building, um, you know, the layers and, and doing the processing. I find that, you know, something isn't exactly working right. So I go back to the raw file and change it there. Um, and it just gives you a higher quality end result. Um, but um, I think one big tip I would give is uh, to, in terms of contrast for an image, um, dark shadows are good, bright highlights are good, um, but I would say never let your shadows go to complete black. Um, I like to ha keep my shadows dark, but have some detail there, because if you have the detail in the shadows, it, it makes the, it's gonna make the image look 
uh, a lot more rich in the end. And um, so, yeah, I don't I know. There's a tendency to overdo contrast, I think, because you just want, I mean, if you don't have a grasp of all these advanced tools and how to do it carefully, then you just want to add more pop to your image. You want your image to stand out more. And so there's a tendency to overdo everything, saturation, contrast, but then it just looks sloppy. Right. Um, yeah, it would look better as the raw. So I think, yeah, for a beginner, an easy hand. I mean, you play with the sliders to see what they do, but uh, yeah, go easy on the adjustments until you really know how to make it look realistic and do it with <clears throat> a deliberate goal. Yeah. Just a quick question for you guys. Little, uh, is there any easy way to identify the color harmony in a particular image? Um, <clears throat> well, I, I would say get familiar with what color harmonies are because there's there's several different types. You know, there's complementary, there's analogous, um, split complementary, double split complementary, um, monochromatic. So once you get familiar with all those and what they are, um, then it's just a matter of looking at your image and um, pinpointing the colors in your image on the color wheel. And something else you have to keep in mind is uh, relative color. So color is either relative or it's absolute. And absolute color is if you were to actually take your um, eyedropper into your image and eyedrop a specific color, it'll give you specific values for what that color is. But actually, um, a lot of colors you perceive differently than what the actual absolute color is. And you pull that's that what, shot of Alex's. Oh yeah, that's what relative color is. Um, I don't have that. I can Alex, do it. Oh, yeah, yeah so pull that up, Alex. You have this to is, end this sharing is, your screen. This will, this, 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 this will kind of blow your mind in terms of color. I mean, at least, at least it blows mine. So we'll, yeah. we'll, we'll let, I don't know, either Ted or Alex talk about it. Ted's really good color. The point I'm making with that is, is you've got to base your, your um, color harmony on the relative color, not the absolute color, because um, the relative color is, is how you perceive it. And it's the colors that you, that you see. Um, and that's what a color harmony should be based on, not the, not the absolute color, which um, Alex's example will, will show you a better give you a better understanding of, of what that what that's all about stop sharing uh, your screen just the red at the top all right so this shot is pretty crazy as far as relative color goes um what color let me ask you how do i pronounce it jossie yeah yeah or anyone uh what color do you think this is here on the left, is this right here? Orange, orange or yellow, probably. Orange, orange right? Orange. Yeah. Okay, let me go on the color picker. Look what color it actually is. <laughs> it's is, like a purplish gray, isn't it? Yeah. It's more, it's more magenta. You can see on his, uh, on the, uh, the, the hue spectrum on the right hand side of that color picker. It's not. It's, it's. It's like bluish blue. purple. Yeah, bluish purple. Oh, but yeah. Because the rest of the scene is so much more blue. Um, yeah, I, I processed the whole thing with a really cool white balance, like way cooler than it should have been, and it was under like a twilight dusk, which the bluish glow of twilight was pervasive. So um, I processed it in a way that all the whites became blue, but now this appears orange, even though it's actually purple. That's yeah, wow. crazy. So that's that's relative yeah. to everything else. It looks orange, but the absolute color you couldn't work off of this because it's not even what it looks like to your eye. True. Yeah. That's mind blowing. Yeah. Really. That's I actually really have something else to show you um, in terms of that. If you want to. I was just going to. Yeah, I guess it sort of looks. If you zoom all the way in and exclude all the context, then it then it sort of looks like the actual color. Yeah. You pulling up that website, Ted? Well, here it is, William. It's saying I have to update my flash, so maybe not. Here, flash. Yeah. <laughs> hey, what's what's it called? It's 
It's um, hold on a second. Same, same or different.com. Mm, okay, here we go. All right. Let me, you uh, got it. Yeah. Um, this, this is a really cool um, little game to look at in terms of relative color and just like how the, yeah, you can take it from here today. All right. I mean, Ted, Ted is a lot more eloquent about color than I am. I'm just like, eh, these two colors look good together. Ted's like, well, color will. Um, but this is, this is a good example of, you know, and, it, and it's a fun game to play. It's just same, same or different.com. And, you know, you look at these two different colors and try to decide if they are the same color in that middle bar. And you don't actually know. And you'll be really surprised once you hover over smush and click it and it pushes them together. So you'll, you know, some of them look exactly the same and some of them look completely different. But there were times like it, it just kind of like really throws you for a loop because I see, I thought that that was the same color, wow. but it, it, yeah. it's a really, I bet these are the same. Not like, you know, this isn't like teaching you anything other than like how um, just that basic idea that color is represented by what it's surrounded by. You know, mm. I'm not like, I'm not like, oh, okay, well that hue looks good with this hue or, you know, when I use this hue, it's like, like, I'm not learning any of that. It's just, it's just a really interesting concept that makes you think about color differently. So, you know, I can only play this for so long before I'm like, okay, I get it. But it's, you know, I already understand this, but it just- It kinda, hasn't done very many same ones yet. They're all- Yeah, I got one different. same one. That, See there's different. one same earlier, yeah. These look so same, different. See, there you go. Same. Oh, it's the yeah. same. But they look so different compared to what they are surrounded by. So, you know, it's, uh, yeah, it's just a really interesting concept. And, that, and actually when Ted, Alex and I were talking about Alex's image a couple of days ago, because we were just talking about this, um, we were like, okay, so if we're in nature and we look at that color, like if we get, if we were like in Alex's photo, we walked up to the edge of that little, that little stream and we looked down at that, is it going to be orange to our eyes or is it going to be that magenta color? And like, it kind of, like, I would imagine that it's, am I mo I'm moving really fast, aren't I? Yeah, what's going on there? Is it catching up? Yeah, I think so. <laughs> I think it's got some lag going on. So, um, but, but it's, it's, it's like, it's interesting to think about, like, you know, if, when we look at that color in real life, is it going to be that, uh, the absolute color or the relative color. And, you know, we're not there to um, figure that out, but. All that really matters is what it appears to be. I'm watching myself. What it really is. Me. Yeah. The, the thing that, that happens with relative colors is colors tend to take on the characteristics of um, the opposite of the environment they're in. So when you do that game, a lot of times you'll see the same color on either side, but one will, will have a very, saturated color around it so it'll make it look less saturated then the one on the other side will have a very desaturated color around it so it looks more saturated and that makes them look completely different and then they come together and it's, it's actually the same color and that so, works with cool and warm too or is that why the purple looked yeah. orange because it was surrounded yeah, so by blue yeah it's it's hue i mean it does it for hue brightness and saturation um uh, on, there's just one thought, uh, Ted and, and probably Alex also and, and TJ. Um, this particular, yeah, on this image, do you think that our eyes are also getting fooled by the all over color palette of the image and making us believe that this particular color is actually orange? That's exactly what it's doing. Yeah, that's yeah. what we're talking about. That's yeah. what relative color is. It's just because, so that, that orange or what we perceive as orange is a magenta. Um, which is a warmer blue, right? Which is if you take blue and warm yeah. it up, you get into the magenta range. But but because it's surrounded by so much um, blue and cool color, um, it makes it look like it's um, you know more warm and more orange, more closer to orange. You know, going back to your. Looks like Alex is doing something here, but going back to your question on, you know, like processing and, and stuff, you know, I think, you know, I know 
I learned a lot of my uh, my techniques from Alex. Alex, you know, I consider Alex like probably my primary mentor, even though he's younger than me. <laughs> but but he's you know Alex is a very technical wisdom minded. doesn't come with age, TJ. No, it doesn't. But Alex is a very technically minded person um, in a way that kind of blows me away. So he has a very almost like an an analytical type way of looking at things where I'm more of like this emotional um, way of looking at things. I, I do more feeling, but, you know, and I think a lot of what Ted, Alex and I do is kind of working on images very in ways that like, it's, it's a lot of small changes that add up to the final image. Um, and, you know, I know the way that I work, you know, it's, I take a lot of time with my images. I don't do a lot of post-processing. I don't do a lot of the stuff that Ted does. Um, but I spend a lot of time on my images and it's just dialing everything in and I know the way that I work. And I think the way that Alex works, um, I can, I have complete control over my image. It's, just, it's very precise using masks and group masks and uh, smart objects and not doing any destructive techniques until the very end, like destructive meaning pixel based uh, stuff like warping and cloning. I don't do until the very end. And what that gives me is the ability to go back to any layer throughout my whole entire stack and dial it in to exactly where I want it to be. And even the way that I work with masks, I'm not painting through masks when I'm applying a color, like to say for um, color dodging or color burning, which is a popular thing to do, dodging and burning with color. Um, everything is controlled by a mask and my whole entire layer is that color. And it's just being applied to the specific area I want, the specific areas I want through masking. So if I come back and I'm like, oh, this color isn't harmonious with this color, I can swap out that whole entire color and adjust it based on hue, saturation, brightness, and then also intensity through uh, opacity, layer opacity. So I have a lot of control over exactly where I get my color. So if it's feeling like maybe two or three degree hue difference off of where I want it, I can very easily just go back into that color, um, go, go back to that layer, swap out the whole entire color and it's, it's right there. I don't have to redo any work. So the way that I work um, gives me like complete, really fine control. You know, we talk about uh, global adjustments versus um, isolated adjustments. And it's kind of like, you know, Alex puts it as almost like using a scalpel versus using an ax. So the way that, you know, I work with my images is very, it's a, uh, it's very precise. So I'm using a scalpel and every single part of my image has been considered and is intended to look how it's seen. You know, I, I, I'm frequently finding color differences in my images that are as small as like two degree hue separation. So I feel like I can see those uh, situations really well. And when I'm working on my images, the color that that image is, it's intended to be that color specifically. Um, so yeah, it's just like, if you learn a way of uh, processing that works for you, maybe, you know, it's different, which is fine. But I find that, you know, the way that I work is what works for me. And that gives me complete control over every single part, every single pixel of my images I have control over down to a very fine um, detail. So that's what works for me. And I think uh, it just gives me an ability to kind of slowly work things in. And I, like I said, I take time. So I'll let my images sit for two, three days, you know, over the course of a month, I have images that I've been working on for years because I don't force it. And I think that's another important thing. Like don't process a photo just to have a photo to process, like process a photo when you're in love with it and when you want to work on it. And if you get to a point where you're feeling like you're not feeling it anymore, put it aside. And then eventually either you won't work on that image, which is fine because that image doesn't speak to you maybe, and maybe it shouldn't be in your portfolio if it doesn't speak to you, that's my view. Um, or it'll come to you at another time where for whatever reason it is calling to you to work on it. And you just, uh, yeah, it's, it's just very important to me that my images um, are exactly where I want them to be. And to do that, I only process images that I want to process and only when I feel like processing processing them. I don't force anything at all. TJ, on that, there are two schools of thought, right? Uh, some people say that pick your best images, like you said, uh, which you know technically look right, visually very compelling, and then process them. 
Uh, the other school of thought is uh, mostly for people who probably get to travel as less, uh, which is you know which is very true in India because as you know we uh, live in very urban dense societies. It's mm-hmm. not easy to get out. Uh, you sometimes basically pick pictures which are closer to your memory, you know, like emotionally closer, you know, like that great beach that you went to after a lot of effort and you try to basically extract the best out of them. Now, uh, you know, like obviously you guys, you know, uh, exhibit different schools of thought in few cases. What would be your collective take on that approach? Pick the best image or pick the one that you're emotional about? Emotional. Yeah, I mean, I, in in my opinion, my best image is the one that I am connected to. You know, like I try to pick the best frame out of all of the ones. Um, there are a couple images in my portfolio that I don't feel comfortable with printing bigger because it has uh, like focused. Like there was a there's one image of a waterfall that I have. You know, it has some ferns down in the foreground, and they were really blowing in the wind. And it's uh, you know it's you know, kind of like a darker forest waterfall image. So I had to use a um, a more wide open aperture in order to get the shutter speed that I wanted without going up to like, you know, 2000 ISO, which on, you know, like four scenes, I don't necessarily like to do because they don't handle the, the noise reduction and grain removal the same way that water does. But, you know, so I shot really wide open, which gave me really shallow depth of field. And then I have these ferns moving. So I try to focus stack them, but they're just kind of a mess because they were moving. So there are a lot of, there's a lot of uh, out of focus ferns and areas in there that I'm not comfortable with, but you know, so is that my best image? No, but it's a waterfall that it's a popular waterfall. Um, but it's one of the waterfalls that when I was doing, when I was like really connecting to photography and really connecting to nature and really fighting these like personal demons that I had, um, it's a waterfall that I walked past more than any other waterfall. So it has a really special place in my heart. Um, and that's why I still have that photo. That's why it's still in my portfolio. And despite its technical flaws, it's still one of my favorite photos. And there's nothing in that photo that I would change. Like when I go through my portfolio, like I said, I, I go through my portfolio a lot. Where I'll just sit and sit on the couch and go through them and like study my images and be like, hmm. You know, I keep noticing this one thing in this image that bugs me. Um, either I need to fix it or eventually I need to live with it or eventually it's going to get um, cut from my portfolio. But there, that photo, despite its technical flaws, because of the emotional connection that I have to that photo, um, that's why I have it. So, you know, I think at the basis of my photography, um, I'm trying to capture the essence of me in nature. I'm distilling my experience in nature down to a two by three frame. So I don't want just a pretty picture. I want something that represents me in my time in nature. And I think I would, if I don't connect to a photo, it's not in my portfolio. And there are some photos that I connect to at some time. And then eventually down the road, you know, I'm like, I'm not feeling that image anymore. It doesn't really speak to who I am. Um, I've moved on from it. So I delete it from my portfolio. So I I, I definitely think emotional connection to the images is paramount for me. How about Alex and Ben? I think So I I have a question. Oh, okay. Uh, Go go ahead, Alex, go ahead. I was just gonna say, it depends on what your goals are because I mean, if you're looking at it from a business perspective, you might recognize that an image is going to be really popular or really um, is technically great and will be loved, but you don't care about it, then maybe you want that in your portfolio. But I mean, yeah, just just uh, being true to yourself, then I guess it'd be the emotional connection. I try to have a combination of both images that I am proud of technically or whatever, and that I feel connected to. So What's Alex, can I ask you a question? Um, uh, my question is about the picture you showed us of the ferns. Uh, uh-huh. You mentioned that you made uh, TJ and uh, uh, and uh, Ted wait for an hour while you took that shot. Uh-huh. So can you talk us through the process uh, of shooting that? Uh, were you shooting um, the focus tags? Were you 
just composing that image? What, what was the process? Um, that's just composing. Hang on a sec, let me pull it up. Um, I was just composing it. Um, they're really, it's one shot at F16, I think, one frame. Um, but if I churned my frame at all, then these ferns didn't seem to have this balance and energy, like the way that they're all kind of, I mean, to me, they feel like they're rotating, like swirling, they have visual flow to them. Initially, when I tried the composition, like slightly turned, because I was looking straight down, I could orient this however I wanted. Um, I felt like they, they look kind of boxy. And actually, I can probably um, show you like upside down, the bottom, it, it looks very flat to me, like this is a straight line. And then up here, this looks very unbalanced, you know. So I don't think the photo works in different orientations. What I spent all the time doing was finding a way that it appeared to be symmetrical and have nice visual flow. Um, so then once I found this orientation, I, for some reason to me, when I look at it this way, it looks like a perfect oval. You know, I don't really care that there's a fern missing here or that there's more on top than there is on bottom. It just works, this orientation. So that's what the time was spent doing. And then just uh, wait, I was actually waiting for light to get out of the frame because there was like a sliver of light coming down on here and it was very distracting and bright. So I waited until the clouds came and everything became shaded again to simplify. And in terms um, of processing, uh, was it just um, shaping the light or was there anything more? Yeah, it was just, the, uh, the color is pretty, that's pretty much done with white balance here. Um, because green and magenta are one of your white balance sliders, just setting the tint a little more green kind of forced everything to be green. And uh, I went with a cooler white balance so that I didn't get yellowish green. I would rather have deep green. Um, so just kind of pushing everything away from yellow, which is the color you get if you take a green shot and push it to magenta or too warm. Uh, so I went pretty cool, pretty green. And then I just dodged up these these upper ferns, which were already naturally brighter because they're higher up off the ground. You know, they're another yeah. six inches off the ground. They catch more light. So they were naturally brighter. It was pretty easy to select them and just dodge them up. And then there was a lot of cloning, a lot of little like little bugs, little holes that bugs had chewed into the leaves and little specks of dirt and stuff like that. I just wanted it to look very pristine and clean. So there was a lot of cloning of little things. OK, thank you. Hi. Yeah, hi, hi, Ted. I have a question for you. Sure. Yeah, so uh, your image uh, breaking fast. That is that is one of the uh, that is one image that affected me towards your work. I think it was back in uh, a few years back, and it was in 500 px. So I just uh, wanted to uh, ask you about. Uh, what went through your mind to create such kind of an image? Because not many people would work on uh, daylight images. And also, as a daylight image, it stands out totally. And it stands apart from what images have come out of uh, Dolomites, if I remember correctly. So could you walk us through a bit? To that I image? just say real quick, that's my favorite photo of Ted's, I think. It's so good. Yep. Thanks. That's actually one of my favorites, too. Um, you should pull it up. Yeah. Or you want me to while you talk? Sure. <laughs> um, so, sorry, the question was. The question um, was uh, not many people would go for a daylight image. So, what made you go for that? And could you just walk us through like what went through your mind or uh, how do you, de how do you, did you decide on the composition, the colors, uh, the processing that went behind it? the amount of time that you spent on observation yeah um well it's hard to it's kind of a hard question to answer because a lot of it and i mean this is this is the case a lot of the times for shooting landscape photography is that you just kind of deal with what you're dealt um and this is what i had to work with this morning um i i gotten up and and went here for sunrise, but, uh, it was actually completely clouded over. Um, 
and it looked like the the clouds were starting to clear through. Um, so while that was happening, I worked on you know getting my composition set up and you know getting all my shots for the rest of the image. You know, mostly for the foreground where I had to do you know just a little bit of focus stacking and whatnot. Um, and I actually had given up on this shot and started to leave um, before this, uh, before the clouds really started to break through and, <clears throat> and do what they're doing in the shot. I was actually hiking out and had crested kind of, you ha kind of have to, you know, from behind where I was standing here, you, you hike out, you know, f facing the other direction. Um, and I was hiking out and just, you go up and over this little hill to get out of where the, the lake is. And as I got to the top, I looked back and like this was happening with the sky. So I, I had to like quickly pull my camera out and take another shot of what was happening with the light on the mountain and, and in the clouds. And then in processing, I, I brought those together. Um, so, you know, I don't, it wasn't really necessarily a decision to, um, shoot, uh, you know, I guess quote midday light, even though this was, this was in the morning. Um, I do think in the end it ended up, it ended up working a lot better because in terms of, of color harmony, you know, if, if the sky in this had had a bunch of color in it, you know, orange and, and whatever, you know, sunrise, um, colors you might have, I don't think it would have worked as well. Um, because, you know, right now you've got the blue green, the, you know, the blue cyan green, um, you know, that, that's an analogous color harmony. So those fit together really well. And if you start throwing in a bunch of warm colors, which are, you know, they're on the opposite end of the, of the color wheel. So it, I don't think it would have, um, you know, all fit together as well color wise as, as this did. And I think that's, I think that's the big appeal of this image is just the, that color harmony. Cause you know, cyan is such a unique color. We don't really see it a lot in nature. Pretty much the only time we see it is in glacial waters. Um, so yeah. Um, does that answer your question? I don't know. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you so much. Yeah. Like, and, uh, and I, and I tell my friends, like whenever we talk about daylight images, this is one of the few images which I share with my friends and talk about it. I oh, appreciate it. Yeah. It's, uh, it's, it was, you know, a lot of it was luck. <laughs> I mean, I, I stayed in the hut, um, you know, right, right near there, the, uh, refugio. So they call them in, in the Dolomites. And, um, when I got up to go out there, it was like, completely clouded over and I almost didn't even go. I was just like, well, this is a wash. Um, but I just went up there by chance and decided just, you know, work on the composition um, in case. And sure enough, something did happen. So I guess if anything, it's, you know, it's a lesson to, you know, don't, always, don't, don't give up. If, if it doesn't look like something's going to happen, you never know. I mean, I've had so many situations where, it didn't look like anything was going to happen with the light. And then sure enough, it did. And I've, I've seen, it was funny. I was in um, Hawaii shooting and I was there with a workshop actually, and we were shooting the scene. And when we got there, there was, there was actually another group there already shooting and the light didn't look like it, anything was going to happen. Um, and the other group left because they, I guess they decided that it was a wash and nothing was going to happen. And literally probably two minutes after they left, the sky just exploded. Um, and I saw that the leader, the workshop leader came back um, by himself and, and just kind of stood off to the side of our group. And he had this look on his face of just <laughs> defeat because he already sent his entire group to, uh, to leave and go home, I guess. But so. <laughs> I should add that it's, it's a lesson that uh, you don't need to shoot at sunrise and sunset that that's not what makes good light necessarily. I mean, you don't need the color for the light to be good or for <clears> the <throat> to be interesting. This is good light. It's just not colorful light. 
Yeah, amazing. I actually, have a whole, um, you know, I have a whole presentation that I did on shooting um, crappy light, and that's a lot of what I shoot. Like, I would say, I, I would say the majority of my images are shot in the middle of the day, when you know it's not a, it's not sunrise or sunset. I just, like I said, I I point at the light that interests me and that's here's, what I go. Here's another example of that kind of light. Yeah, so this this shot, um, yeah, this is uh, called Cascade Mountain High and, and Ted was actually, Ted, you missed this shot. Uh, me um, and my friends, uh, Ted and Eric Bennett and Michael Bellino um, backpacked into this location. And for me, you know, I'm really out of shape. Uh, it was a really tough hike for me. It's like eight or nine miles in and uh, I'm not good at a uh, metric, but you know, I consider steep being like maybe 1000 feet of elevation gain in one mile, I would say is a, is a steep hike uh, to get up into this basin. The, the last push is 2000 feet of elevation gain in uh, what, like half a mile. So it's like, it's really, really steep. And I had, we had like five days of food, camping gear and photography gear on my back. So it was a, uh, really hard on my body. Um, and Ted actually ended up hiking out early because it was hard on his body too. You twisted your knee and it was really stormy the night before. Uh, it was like 17 degrees, it was very cold. And uh, we just kind of spent this day in our tent. And in the middle of the day, it was probably like three o'clock in the afternoon. I had to use the bathroom. So I went to the bathroom and on the way back, I saw this and it was just like this really like this midday light just kind of spotlighting through all these clouds that were just commingling and dancing with these peaks. So there was like, a, actually there were a bunch of peaks hidden in those clouds behind. And I stood there for like 10 minutes and I was just like, I should be photographing this. So I ran back to my tent and I told my friends and we stood there probably for like a good hour, two hours, um, just photographing this midday light as, as the light just kind of like went across the scene, lighting up these different colors of the trees, lighting up this peak and then that peak and then these trees and then those trees and then the clouds like hiding this peak and then hiding that peak and you know just kind of swirling around everything and I probably have 300 shots not exaggerating of this exact composition or slight variations of it and each one of those photos exists for a reason because at that moment in time I was compelled to press the shutter and capture the light here the light there, the clouds here, the clouds there. So, you know, my whole entire experience of shooting this scene was those 300 photos. And I have to pick one of them to represent the other 299 photos. And that's a really hard decision for me to make a lot of times. You know, like I said, like I spend a lot of times exploring what I'm shooting and developing that relationship with it. So especially when I'm shooting water, I do a lot of water photography. Like I have so many slight variations of movement and everything like that, that it just gets so overwhelming to pick just one. And that's a lot of reason why I haven't released a lot of shots is because I can't pick one image to distill that whole experience down into. I love so many of them. So to pick one of them to represent the whole entire experience is very hard. But yeah, exact. this is a perfect example of shooting in the middle of the day. And Alex, if you go to... Um, Rising light in winter in the west. So, do you guys uh, camp in the upper lakes region here in the enchantments? What's that? So, you guys camp in the upper lakes region in enchantments. The last photo. Yeah, we were camped uh, not too far from there. That's called uh, yeah the enchantments wilderness up in Washington. Yeah, like was it the upper lakes that yep. there is the upper, lakes yeah, the lakes. upper basin? You have to have permits to get in there, and uh, I think what like yeah. five or six of us applied for permits, and one of us got it. Yeah, um, it's lottery so. and all. I got it actually. Yeah, Alex got it. He didn't even end up coming. But this shot here, uh, you know, this is of Mount Whitney, and it's you know like it's not the most um, creative shot. You know, it's this is pretty much if you stand in Alabama Hills and you look out, this is what you see. But you know, we woke up. We were on a workshop here, and it was a workshop that um, was full of like a lot of my past clients and people that I consider really good friends. And we got up and we went to this location. We were expecting like, you know, good sunrise light. We were hoping for good sunrise light. And that didn't happen. Um, and there was another group there, kind of like what uh, Ted had said about Hawaii. There was another group of photographers there, you know, maybe like 
75, 100 feet away. And, you know, after the, the magic hour, after sunrise, they left. Maybe they had somewhere to go. I don't know, whatever. But then, like, right after they left, like, the clouds parted and the sun shone. Like, this was, like, again, like, late morning light. is probably, like, 11 o'clock, 10 o'clock, 11 o'clock in the morning. And sunrise is, like, 8 or something like that. So a couple hours after sunrise. And we stood there for a good hour, hour and a half, just like watching this light and shadow move across the scene. And the same thing, the clouds were kind of dancing with the peaks. And, you know, I picked this image because it had a really good uh, layering of the light. And then like the shape of the white clouds above the peaks kind of mimicked the shape of the peaks. So that's why I picked that one. But, you know, again, it's, it's prioritizing the experience over getting a shot. Like if I was just like, oh crap, you know, sunrise is over, didn't get a shot and I left. I never would have gotten to experience this moment watching this scene with a bunch of really good friends. And we were all just jazzed about shooting. We were like, wow, this is great. And one of the clients, it was her birthday. So we were like, man, this is like, it was like the perfect birthday gift, you know, just like this gift of light and just spending time in a really beautiful place with really good friends and just watching like, you know, this magic happen in front of us. And we never would have gotten that if we just left after sunrise. Yeah, uh, so uh, TJ and Alex, I have uh, two of my uh, favorite images from you are one is uh, Mosaic Decay and the other one is uh, Impasto. So Mosaic Decay, why? Because it looks like just like a, uh, like, uh, a group of cells uh, seen through a microscope. Yeah. yeah. That, so that yeah. shot... So I'm, I'm I, very I, much attracted to uh, abstract images. And then uh, in Pasto, it just looks like a painting by Van Gogh. So could you tell us, both of you, like, could you tell us a bit about those? So since Alex is digging um, for his image, I'll tell you about mine. So uh, Mosaic Decay, it's, um, it's actually a leaf that's probably, you know, maybe about that big. It's a, on a plant called Oregon Grape. And my girlfriend and I were out uh, just being in nature, um, collecting falling leaves and photographing and stuff like that. And it was probably November. And I looked under, like just on the forest floor and I saw these leaves with this really interesting kind of like fungal pattern almost. And I didn't know what it was. And I, I have later learned um, what it's called and stuff, but um, it just like, it was just, just this really, it was really interesting. Um, but I didn't have a good lens to shoot it with. And this is like actually one of the images where I'll get into that in a little bit. But so basically what I did is I took these images, these leaves home um, because I didn't have a macro lens to shoot. And it was out in the field and it was windy and like things are moving. And in order to capture this image sharply, I either had to use a really long, uh, um, a really long, uh, I'm sorry, a really small aperture to get that depth of field or focus stack. and it just wasn't happening um, out in the field. So I actually brought these leaves home, a selection of them and bought a macro lens specifically for this shot. And also because I wanted a macro lens and also a light box. So I actually photographed this image in my living room um, very methodically, which is not the way I like to operate. You know, like the more, like when I'm shooting the scene again, like it's about that relationship um, with that thing. And the more things that get between me and the subject I'm shooting, whether it's equipment or uh, technique, the the more I'm involved in that side of it and not the emotional relationship that I'm building with it. So this is a really odd image for me because I do really like it, but I'm disconnected from it in a way that I knew that it was in my living room and a light box, methodically um, focus stacking with you know a macro lens um, on these really interesting leaves. And I think I ended up, I shot a couple different compositions of it. Um, and this image was like taken, gosh, I don't know, like maybe like F50 something, um, just because I, I, I hate, I hated the focus stacking and doing everything like just so and having to like perfect everything. So I just, I stopped down as far as I could on my uh, macro lens and just did like a eight second exposure in a light box. And this ended up being the best composition, but I do really like this image because I was just so fascinated by those leaves. Um, and I actually have, I don't have it readily accessible, otherwise I would show you, but I actually have a picture of this leaf that I shot in my hand in the field. And yeah, it's just, uh, 
I had never seen this before ever. And I wouldn't have noticed it if I wasn't just like out in nature, enjoying the moment, looking around at the smaller details and noticing these leaves and being like, what's that? And then uh, kind of learning a little bit more about it. Amazing lesson on observation and looking for the detail. Yep. Just like I said, just, you just, I wasn't looking for a photo. I was just out doing what I do. And, you know, I, I think that when you are, uh, when you go looking for something out in nature, you're putting yourself in a box. You're, 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 when you, when you have, when you're in search, searching mode, um, the things that you're going to notice are the things that like you've probably already been familiar with. But if you just go out and not have those expectations and not look for anything and more like, instead of looking, you listen and you feel then the landscape will start speaking to you and showing you things that you might not have noticed otherwise. If I was, if I was just like, oh, you know, I'm going out into this area. Um, I know there's a creek and I know there are trees and I know there are ferns. Like, and that's what I'm going to go shoot. I would have shot the creek. I would have shot the trees. I would have shot the ferns. And I would have walked right past all these leaves because I'm so honed in on searching for something specific. But if I just went out and was just like, you know what? I don't care about that creek. I don't care about those trees. I don't care about those ferns as a photo um, and just interact with them and touch them and explore them. And then, then you start noticing all these things that the landscape is showing you instead of you going out to find. It's not a scavenger hunt, you know? That's not how I, that's, that, that's, that's just not how I operate. Right. Uh, I have that's... a question for Ted. No, I think uh, there's one for Alex as well, right? So I just, oh, just, Alex, go ahead, go ahead. Oh, it's just, just uh, the one that he asked about. It's the same yeah, the same sort of thing as TJ. I didn't expect this image. Uh, I was out on a hike with my girlfriend, and I had my camera with me because I've made the mistake of not having it with me so many times. And then I find <laughs> something I want to shoot, and then all I have is my phone, and you really can't do a lot with that. So I... Uh, had it with me luckily and, and I didn't find a shot the whole hike and then on the way out I just saw this stump lying on the ground and it had this little section of swirled wood maybe like three inches wide and uh, I isolated part of it I see a scene in it it looks kind of like Van Gogh I see right. a tree that's kind of tree that it came from a juniper tree I see that tree right here this kind of thick trunk and then the big branches coming out on both sides and maybe the tree extending up that way. And then maybe these are stars in the sky. I don't know. I, I right. kind of see a scene within it. So that that's what drew me to it. And it's just a little macro of something maybe an inch and a half wide in this frame. And I, I easily could have walked right past it, but I happened to look down while I took that step and found one of my favorite photos. And I hadn't seen anything the whole hike. So you really just can't prepare for it. You have to go with no expectations and just be open to what you see. Yeah, I, I'm, a, I'm a fan of uh, like abstract work. So the moment I saw this image, Van Gogh came to my mind. So I just wanted to confirm it. Like, did it happen to you as well? So, yeah. yeah, that's why. And props to Guy Tall, because that's actually why I saw it. He had a photo. Uh, Guy Tall is an amazing photographer, if yeah, you don't know. He's him. another inspiration for me as well. He, he had a photo of this same sort of subject, like some sort of bark. I think it was juniper bark. And... Uh, I think that was like four or five years ago or something, but he put a Van Gogh quote with it. And so that made the connection for me. And then every time I've seen this bark, I've seen little scenes within it, like Van Gogh paintings. And then I finally found my own, but props to him. That's where the inspiration came from. Right. Thanks. Thank so, you. Thank someone you. had a question for Ted? Oh, gosh. Yeah. Actually, I wanted to ask you, Ted, you are more of a uh, moody photographer. Like when the images you Prakash, show, Prakash, like... your voice is not very clear. Okay, can you hear me now? Yeah, yeah, go ahead. Yeah. Yeah. Actually, I was saying your images are more moody, like Crown of Nazgul or India or Strike One, those kind of images. So, do you photograph them that way, or do you edit them afterwards to present that mood? Um. <clears throat> Pretty much photographed them that way. Like it, I, I wouldn't really ever recommend someone try to fake that kind of thing because it just never ends up looking all that great. Um, I've tried it in the past, 
and I've, I've never, um, I've never really been very successful trying to do that. And, um, it just, um, it's much, it's, you know, it's just much more meaningful, um, when, when you create an image like this and, and it was actually like that, you know, um, that's not to say I don't do um, processing to bring that out more, but there's got to be something there to work from. Um, and, you know, I don't always uh, go out for that type of thing, but, um, you know, I got to admit, like, it's, it's quite the rush to um, shoot photography of, of this type of thing. Like, that's why you see so much so much of this style of photography out there is just because it's it's fun it's fun to shoot um so yeah, they look they look much much colorful and more something to look at yeah true yeah i mean you know see, seeing how light can um interact with the world uh is just i mean it's just awesome and you know it is the basis of Exactly. Landscape photography, pretty much. Ted, is your website terribly out of date? Because I'm thinking of a creek shot in the Dolomites with like towers on both sides, and I can't see it in your. Uh, There's like shot. a silvery creek coming through the middle. Oh, that's um, yeah, that's not on there. Um, that's from that's from France, actually. Yeah. Um, it's not even on your website. Is it in recent work? I thought it was. Yeah. Oh, there it is. Yeah. Oh, yeah. That's that. what I was thinking of. Another of my favorite TED shots. Yeah, that's... Um, is this uh, I'm trying to remember the name of that place. Um, Keep I can't remember the name of it. Oh, Van Wall. Yeah. Van it's Van Wall National Park in, in, in the Alps. Um, yeah, super cool place. I mean... It kind of just it kind of just shoots itself, you know. It's like I didn't really have to do a whole lot of searching. I mean, yeah, yeah but I think I think no one aside from Ted Gore would come up with quite <laughs> a striking, quite this striking of an image from places like that. I again from the same album. There's an uh, I think from the same trip as well. Purple Poison, Ted. I think it's in the same album as well on the site. Oh. Yeah, purple poison. Yeah. So, uh, what time? Uh, which which month was this shot in? Um, August, I think. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Because so many people have tried imitating this composition, so many, um, and you know, like, so how how do you feel when you see people imitating your composition or other people, com you know, com stomping, as they say? I mean. It's kind of like, look, I mean, I've done it in the past. I've, I've copied other people's compositions. So, um, but there always, there always is a little bit of like a, a hit of like, um, you know, <laughs> you want to be like, Hey, you know, don't, don't take my stuff, man. But, or at least um, credit you. Yeah. Yeah. Or at least credit me. Yeah. I, I've actually, um, it's funny that you you say you've seen a lot of people copy this. I've, I've only seen one, I think one shot um, from here that was shooting these flowers with the mountain and everything. But if you say there's more, then that's yeah, interesting. There's more. There's more. There's more. <laughs> well, what time was this shot? Like, uh, you know, because there's one image that drew me to such era. This one image. What time was it? Yeah, what time of the day? Uh, this is sunset. Okay. So, um, yeah, we, we, we hiked up here that I actually shot this on a workshop. Um, I was leading a workshop. Um, so I actually had, I shot the foreground probably an hour before the light on the mountain happened because, um, you know, I, I had to let the workshop students, um, you know, I had to give them priority in terms of finding composition. So I went in and, and grabbed this foreground um, beforehand so that I had it to work with um, and then just kind of sat back and 
and shot the light on the mountain as it happened later. But um, it, was, it was another one of these days where it didn't look like anything was going to happen. And then there was just this, you know, sliver opening off on the horizon. And the light just shot right through it and gave us this awesome, you know, stripe across the mountain. So this is why you shoot at sunrise and sunset in the first place, rather than I, I feel like a lot of people see that as like, oh, those are the only times to shoot. Well, this is why, but this is utilizing the light. Like it doesn't mean that every shot is best at sunrise or sunset. This shot is like why you're doing it. Look at the look at the light on there. It's crazy. Yeah. Yeah. yeah and I, I think a, a good lesson to take from this shot is is to um you know you can you can spread out like in, like I said, with this, I shot the foreground before I shot the light on the, the background. You don't have to shoot everything all at one time. Um, I like to do this a lot just because it gives you it gives you time to relax a bit and appreciate the moment a bit more. Um, but you have to do it. You know, I could do it here because there were, there wasn't any direct light on the foreground. Um, so it was independent of what was happening with the background so that they could be brought together um and not look like they were you know separated but um and then you also have to you know not really have any areas of the image where they're intersecting like you know if there were a tree coming up and um intersecting with the background then that would make that would make it a lot more difficult and this was actually a bit of a um a focal length blend as well i zoomed in a bit for the uh, shot of the mountain. That light on the flowers, it looks like it's reflected off the mountain. Yep. Whatever you did to those, it's crazy. Magic. Looks good. Yeah. <laughs> so um, Nate and TJ, um, I think I bumped into you guys last year, February, uh, when I was in a workshop with Mark Adamas workshop. So do you have any thoughts from that tip, trip last year, February? when I think we bumped into you on the Zabriskie point. No, not Zabriskie point, Dante's view. Death Valley. No, that, was me. that was me and TJ, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Do you have any yeah. thoughts from that trip? Any memorable thoughts? Tell, yeah, tell, them, what Mark, tell them what Mark said to you, TJ. <laughs> <laughs> Mark is all about, uh, you know, he said that uh, you are the numerator you know in processing. Uh, dead girl. I mean, he yeah. quoted that. You, can quote you mean that from that day? day? Is that or the... I have one we, from that day. We went to Ibex yeah. that night, right? Yeah, I have. I go, if you go to, uh... I shot this that night at Ibex. I think this pink one. No, we got there. Yeah, 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 yeah. You got that one. This right. was what I shot later. Uh, oop, not you, Ted. <laughs> so it's under twenty nineteen. TJ, what did he say to you? Something like, "Well, there you are." Yeah, I was like, so. Um... Is that alien? That was the first time I'd ever met Mark. Um, I, we've interacted on, online before or whatever. And you know, he was in workshop mode. Yeah, um, yeah. He was in workshop mode. Yeah, so I walked, I was like, I was like, hey Mark, you know, it's uh I was like, hey, you know, good to meet you, TJ, TJ Thorne. He's like, and he just he just looked at me, he went, Oh, well, there you are. And then like turned around and like walked away. I was like, okay. <laughs> Actually, he he apologized for that later. Because he was like, he's like, he's he's just like, I just saw what, what was going on with the sky, and I really wanted to get my workshop group, you know, set up and everything. So I knew he wasn't chat. I wasn't like offended or anything. I think you were actually uh, this... on that workshop with one of my friends, uh, yeah. another client of mine. Hear me. Um, oh, wow. But yeah. So this, so this shot um, I took right before you guys got there. Oh, okay. So you know, and it was funny because like I think Mark was. Uh, I mean, I, it, from what I remember, I think he was telling you to like, kind of like grab your wide angles because you had like these awesome clouds going on. Oh. Yeah. Awesome clouds, and you had a, uh, you know, the playa down below. But what Alex and I were shooting was just like the dappled light moving across these uh, the the colorful minerals and stuff. Mm -hmm. So we spent like probably a good what like an hour or something there shooting the dappled light, and then we we're like, um, let's go scout ibex. So what that we 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 met we left um, right when you guys were getting there. So um, but yeah, this okay. this shot is from like probably an hour before you guys got there. So another, another thing to say is like, you know, you guys went up there for sunset pretty much, right? right. Yeah. 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 So and, and Alex and I were up there because we, we saw the opportunity. We knew there was a, it was partly cloudy with, uh, you know, there was yeah, yeah. Light around. 
So mm -hmm. Alex and I went up there specifically for that reason. We saw the sky was creating dappled light. And we're like, hey, you know, we're going to Ibex anyway. Let's stop at Dante's view and get up there and shoot the dappled light. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. And then we went to the dunes later that night and shot dune stuff. So. Oh, wow. Alex shot dune stuff. Alex dune? Okay. Was it like at night you mentioned or towards the dusk, the dunes? Yeah, this was dusk. I didn't find a composition until dusk. I think this was like a five minute exposure, actually. Just oh, the very wow. last one I could have gotten. <laughs> yeah. Nice. Yeah, and then the next, yeah. The Death Valley is awesome. Um, I don't mean to put a damper on things, but I, I might need to go soon here. Coming up on three hours, right? Yeah. I think we are closing in for three hours. We didn't even realize okay. it. In yeah. That's the beauty of uh, talking photography with um, like-minded people and wonderful photographers. I think the time just flows. Yeah. Like so th this is the Lord of the Rings of photography, man. <laughs> yeah. So you have something to ask? Uh, there, there was a YouTube panel question. Um, again, I think I'll probably go around and starting with Alex and take everybody's view of uh, because landscape photography has become so competitive and I've actually, you know, like heard a couple of times firsthand from my friends uh, in competition specifically in competitions. Uh, I don't want to name a competition, but in competitions, obviously a lot of, you know, a uh, lo lot of acclaimed uh, photographers get approached asking to Photoshop pictures on behalf of other people. Right. Mm. Those yeah. Guys. Right. So I was curious to know what are your views around that practice and you know, what do competitions do better to probably stop that from happening? Well, I think that the person who shot the photo in the first place probably, I mean, say you're an acclaimed photographer or any photographer, don't have to be acclaimed. Say you're someone that, uh, that, provides the service of processing photos for someone else. Um, ghost processing, I've seen some people refer to it as. Uh, you don't know what they're going to do with their photo after. So if if someone were to enter that in a competition, that's on them. That's their moral decision to take something that someone else worked on and enter it as their own. I mean, that's, I, I don't really have a stance on it aside from that's just look at the rules, you know, is that, is that what they are allowed to do? Is that what they're comfortable doing? I mean, I think the person processing the photo doesn't really know uh, what they're going to do with it, but. <laughs> yeah, I agree with that. Are you looking for me to be more, <laughs> more specific because I don't want to be. No, I mean, uh, no, I just, somebody asked <laughs> I thought I'll let you know. Oh, was that asked in the YouTube comments? Yes. Oh, yeah. I mean, <clears throat> if you provide a service, you don't know what they're going to do with the product after. That's that's up to them. It's complicit in murder. What's that? It's been complicit in murder. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Get some detectives on it. <laughs> Start looking at EXIF data. Yeah. Anyway. Yeah. I, I saw that if I ever process anybody's image, I put a really light watermark of my face hidden in it. Uh, I look for it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's a good idea. I was, yeah, and I remember somebody just, you know, like messaging him, like, dude, can you process my photo? And we're like shooting together. I'm like, dude, why is she heckling you? And he said that because I'm good looking. <laughs> I like to do it. Not listening to this. So, so uh, anything else to? I think uh, I think that's it. Uh, uh, I think we've covered most of the YouTube questions as they came. So, so, somebody I think just you know out of humor, somebody is asking if you guys are not into photography. Then what? What are you doing? What would you be doing? Would you go back to your past lives, past exciting lives? I don't know. I, I'd, I'd probably still be cooking just because that's all I really know, you know? 
I, you know, I, I'm not <clears throat> passionate about cooking anymore or working in restaurants or anything like that. You know, that, that was my life at one point, but um, yeah, I don't know, like photography is such an important part of my life now that that's all I do. So I don't know what I would do without it, but I'm glad I have it. I would do the same thing I'm doing now, but without taking pictures, just traveling and spending a lot of time in nature with my girlfriend. I'd... And doing IT for money, probably. What's that? Yeah, then probably I do soon. computer work for money instead, but I'm lucky enough to make a living on the art. So. Okay. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> Motion graphics. Yeah. Working I mean, on I, yeah. Motion graphics is still my, my career. Um, so I guess I'd just be doing that. Is it called uh, feature films then? Is it called feature films? No, it's mostly for um, commercial or networks. I, I have done some stuff for movies, but um, not very often. But you did do something for some popular show, right? Something recently? uh are you even allowed to talk about it <laughs> yeah um i just don't was it a, maybe it was a movie yeah. i remember you telling me some big time project that you did something for like i don't even remember i i mean i do so many different projects they all just kind so, of work together. he's he's such a big deal he can't even remember yeah <laughs> not really right <clears throat> but but i did want to mention you know we had a you know, we had, we had the we did a lot of talk about processing and everything. So Alex, oh, yeah. and I, we did do a we we put a bundle together where you can get our one each of our videos, um, and it's our best selling video from each of us. So it's three videos, and it's like a hundred and ninety five dollar value for uh, ninety nine bucks for a limited time only. So if anybody was interested in uh, learning about our processing and how we do that, um, this is a pretty affordable way to do it that also you know supports us as artists. So. If you want to purchase that or take a look at it, um, the URL is going to be uh, tjthornphotography.com backslash product backslash video dash tutorials. And uh, yeah, it's that one there on the left hand side. So you get uh, each of those videos. And uh, yeah, so if you're interested in that. Yeah, yeah. So, so what I'll do is, uh, so this is available for What's up? Um, how, how long? Peter? The rest of the month, right? Yeah, probably the rest of the month. Yeah. Yeah. The rest we, of the month. Yeah. So, so what we'll do is we'll we'll put these uh, uh, details up in the description and in the comment, and we'll pin it also, and we'll we'll start uh, sharing it with uh, every everybody who attended and everybody who just could not even attend, and will probably come and watch it later um, for their benefit. So we'll do that. Awesome. All right. Thank you. Cool. That's going to be a wonderful, this is one of the best offers that you can make. So, so I'll make a note of this and, and probably will share all the links. Cool. Thank you. Well, thanks for having us on, guys. Yeah, it was fun. It was great having you on. Yeah, it's been, it's been such a wonderful time. I think uh, by far the best um, session um, in this in this uh, whatever series that we have we have created extra bytes and uh, this has been extra bytes so and thank you guys <laughs> extra, for extra bytes <laughs> thank you guys for really opening your heart out and i think uh, that your honesty showed and and that in, i think that is the differentiator between uh, uh, and and i think i think that is why uh, the, our faith and everything in 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 terms of photography and great photographers is re-established and, and we know that uh, why people look up to you as uh, their role models or um, it's inadvisable I, by the way yeah. <laughs> don't we're don't look up just, to uh, <laughs> we're just dudes we're just guys that you know yeah. we just do what we like you know we don't <laughs> sorry know, i didn't mean to interrupt you <laughs> I, I, don't, I don't have a high i don't have a high view of myself um so i kind of find it crazy that yeah uh, i don't have a high view of tj either that's <laughs> That just, shows, that just shows he has good taste. <laughs> I'm not going to go to public with this, but you haven't touched alcohol for what now? Ever since you picked up photography, which happened first? 
Wait, which one? Uh, you know, leaving alcohol, quitting alcohol, taking up photography. Which happened? Oh, photography. Photography. Okay. Yeah, like I, I, you know, I've been using a camera for a long time, and then uh, nature and photography is what helped me um, stop drinking. And come uh, September. September. Yeah, come uh, September, if I make it that long, I'll have uh, 10 years without a drink. So that's really important to me. Um, it's, you know, it's, uh, yeah, nature and photography saved my life. That's the easiest way to put it. Good one. Thank you. Thank you. Guys, Thanks for having us, guys. Everybody thumbs up and I'll take the screenshot. Thank you. Everybody thumbs up. See you guys. It's a wonderful Bye. session. I think one of the best so far. So, uh, yeah. Oh, I missed oh, it. Did I miss it? Yeah. Okay. yeah just a minute. Just a minute. Just a minute. I, I'll say one, two, three, and then everybody does it. Yeah. One, two, three. Yeah. Done. All right. So thank you so much, guys. It's been really great. And uh, and I'm going to share all those um, the bundle that you're offering. And uh, I think uh, uh, we've had people really hooked on to this session. Um, three plus hours now. And that that really proves that it, it's not possible. Uh, if it's not interesting, if it's not engaging, then you just can't stick for so long. And thank you for sparing your time um, and um, making this session what it is. Absolutely. Thanks for having Thanks. us. Thanks. Thanks. Um, thank you. Sorry. Agreeing to join us. Thank you, Alex. Thank you, DJ Thon. And thank you, everybody. Himadri, Atanu, Som, Sandeep. Yeah, it was Martin. nice to meet you guys. Bye. Take care, guys. Stay safe. Bye bye. Take care. Stay safe. Bye bye. Bye bye. Bye bye.